Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Time with Caffeine, the only podcast where we do stuff like this. This is my first after show debate, just debate after show program. Had to happen sooner or later, I guess. Yeah, I hope it's fun. I think it will be. Uh, I and, think it will be too. And and Dapper. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, yes. I, I get. I get. I'm getting. Sorry, I'm getting an echo right here. There. I'm getting, uh, you're getting right. an echo for me. No echo for myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> My my YouTube channel turned on automatically. And oh right. <laughs> so, um, so, so, any, so anyways, you, you, you don't think it's my fan at all? I can't hear your fan. Anyways, okay. um, I was saying, oh yeah, uh, Eric's been on my channel before, mm -hmm. but Dapper Dino is a new guest for new guest for before we talk into so introduce yourself, new guest for new guest. So uh, I'm the Dapper Dino. I run a YouTube channel by the same name. Um. <clears throat> my content is mostly counter creationism, especially young earth creationism. Um, I go into a lot of stuff like paleontology. Uh, there's geology. There's astronomy in there. There's some uh, sprinkling of physics in there. Uh, I would say that the area I'm strongest on is probably <clears throat> uh, Mesozoic Ornithodirons is probably my strongest area, followed by sort of a general a pretty good internal cladistics map that I, you know, still double check every once in a while, but yeah, those are probably my strong areas. Uh, so if you like that kind of stuff, check out my channel. There's links somewhere probably. Uh, so was this being, was this your first moder moderation, being a moderator? Uh, yes, it was actually not just on air, but ever. <laughs> Guess that happened sooner or later. Yeah, exactly. And, um, it was, I had a lot of fun. I, when it was over, I was, I was a little tired. <laughs> I can understand why. Yep. Um, and I, I think both debaters did a pretty good job of not talking, not talking over. I got a little bit less well behaved during the Q and A, but you know. Yeah. I would say I got a little heated then. And uh, yeah. And what's funny originally who I asked to be the, the moderator was actually Michael, but then, you know, Michael said that he didn't really know what to do, you know, as the moderator. And so, and then, um, my, my friend, Michael's very, very passionate about his projects. And so, and then after that, I thought that, Hey, maybe a way to bring exposure to his projects as if I bring him on, you know, to, you know, to do the debate with me. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I think, so I've had a, a day or so to sort of reflect on it. I guess now I've had almost two days to reflect on it. Yeah. Um, and I think that <clears throat> overall, I think Cody probably would have been convincing to other young earth creationists. And I don't think he would have been terribly convincing to people who aren't young earth creationists. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that he was pretty slick in terms of his opener and um, <clears throat> I feel like he did a little bit more uh, prep work in terms of coming up with how he was going to say what he was going to say. Not necessarily the research part, but just the <clears throat> sort of writing out a script. Uh, from, from what I, 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 I rewatched it this morning, part of it at least, but from what I, I, I remember of it is that he didn't really get any, any evidence of the actual thing. He just said all he did really was was make the, the talk about how the Bible is the authority. Yeah, and he tried to use dragon legends as evidence for some reason. Yeah, and the thing about biblical authority, that even was something that I pointed out to him and like that's not an issue on biblical authority. It's an issue on interpreting scripture and I even point out to him like that flat earthers Dinosaur deniers, they all will say the same thing, like that you're undermining biblical authority. Oh, yeah, and uh, Cody left a comment saying, I wish I could join. Um, I, yeah, like, this, like, just popped up. Well, I'd say yeah, give him the link. I, I'm I'm perfectly happy to have him in. And Joseph Grant said, too bad, Dapper Dino's great. Uh, well, thank Joseph you. Grant, uh, too bad for what? 
Yeah. I'm not sure actually what the too bad part is. <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm not sure either. But I will say, I think uh, Cody definitely lost at least the audience who was in the chat when he said, um, oh, what was it exactly he said? I think he's, it was when I, <clears throat> I believe it was one of the question of, because I was trying to get it back on topic because we were going on to Adam and Eve and things, and the chat was saying, hey, we need to get this back on topic. And so I tried to push it towards what evidence would you present that doesn't depend on the Bible? Mm -hmm. And the answer was none. I think he lost anyone who didn't already agree with him at that point. Yeah, and uh, the thing about, you know, uh, you know, what? Oh, no, I just... <clears throat> Oh, sorry. And so, you know, like I said during the debate, it's not like that I am, uh, it's not like that I'm anti young earth creationist or anything. You know, I have friends who are young earth creationists, and that's fine. You know, we agree to disagree. It's just the issue that I have is when, you know, young earth creationists will then say, oh, well, it's either you interpret it my way or the highway. And what I was trying to point out to him uh, is like that. That's actually causing a lot of uh, Christians to leave the faith. It's because when they go off to college and learn about evolution and and so and then they feel like that. Oh, well, I, I have to choose either the science or my faith. And uh, when I talked with Mary Schwartz on the phone a year ago, she actually told me like that a lot of her students like will come into her office, you know, bawling their eyes out, feeling like that they have to give up their faith. And um, I've had a lot of Christian parents come come out to me telling me like that they're horrified of taking their kids to the Museum of the Rockies because of evolution. And I've had a lot of my uh, Christian friends come up to me telling me that, oh, well, you know, I don't know um, if I have to give up my uh, faith because of evolution. And, um, and you know, and even the majority of atheists actually were once Christians, like Richard Dawkins, uh, Hugo and Jake, Heath, and etc. Um, most of them will tell you like that they were once Christians, but then you know, but then when they're presented the evidence for evolution and old Earth, they felt like that they had to give up their faith, and so. Yeah, I went from like old Earth creationist. I think I think I was ever a younger creationist. I, was, I think I was an old Earth for a while. Then I went to, <clears> the, <throat> the, the, the theistic evolutionist. <laughs> And uh, Cody, maybe I you did more give more than Dragon Legends. I seem to remember that being a large portion of it. But um, did did we give Cody the link? Um, I also remember like that Cody even mentioned like the T Rex soft t tissue. Yeah, but has Cody been given the link? Uh, I have no idea. I said kind of. Uh, he said, I kind of wish I could join. I assume I won't be sent a link. I would like for him to be sent a link. I'm not sure how to do that on my end. I'm not sure either. You just uh, copy and paste the link and send to him. Like, I, I, know, I, can't have, I have no, oh, I have the, no way to contact him. Oh, the link you sent us in Discord? All right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Eric, I assume you have the uh, his uh, Cody's contact info, right? Because I don't. Uh, I, I do have his email. All right. Could you email him that link? Uh, yeah. Uh, Hold on. Okay. Because, uh, Cody, I would very much prefer that you have a link sent to you. <clears throat> That's That would be my strong preference. Okay, uh, let me... Okay. Uh, Although so, I, yeah, so anyways... I, I, have, um, oh, what? Sorry. I was going to say, one. I have to admit that one of the areas where I sort of broke the whole moderator role thing is um, I have a bit of a pet peeve, which is when people try to use their understanding of the quote original language of a text when it's a language they don't speak. So <clears throat> yeah, um, like when someone starts going on about the ways that you can use the word yom in Hebrew or what the Greek word that's in most uh, Bibles translated as faith actually means in Greek, and they don't actually speak Hebrew or Greek. And so that's where I, I lost a little bit of my complete neutrality there, because it's, sorry, it's just one of those things that gets me, because I see a lot of people do it, and it's just, 
<clears throat> it leads to people making bad arguments without knowing it because they think they know more than they do about the language. Yeah, and the thing about the Hebrew word yom, and I mean, you know, there are some times in the Bible when it does mean a 24-hour day, but there's also times when it can mean a lot of things. It can mean a go, always, and et cetera, and so and then. I mean, even I, they, you know, I can't what? speak. I, the, the closest I come to knowing much about the Hebrew word yom is that I know most of the uses for the Arabic cognate in Arabic. That's what right. I get. It's so Without before Cody gets on here, uh, Eric, was there any, any part of the debate you thought you, you, did, you did that in? Like any part you let you, so you could well, do over again? Because it got off topic with Adam and Eve, I kind of felt like I should have done a little bit more research on that. But at the same time, though, afterwards, I uh, um, I did do the research and, and you know, and it actually did back up like my claim. Um, it actually says in First Corinthians and like that. Um, like that, um, like that mall of man, like will be uh, like the, the dust and like to represent uh, human mortality. And uh, man, it also backs up, you know, like my whole claim about how, uh, like about how, uh, like about how uh, you have to be cautious about taking some things in the Bible to literally. I um, mean, you know, Madam and Eve are pretty much are supposed to represent all of humanity, like for like our sinful matter. And even um, in the original Hebrew text, when I've done some uh, research, I mean, actually doesn't even mention rib at all. That, that actually is just something like that was just uh, matted in and like through uh, English translations, probably because I, I just don't think they had a word for that. Um, it actually says that uh, Eve was made from Adam's side. And uh, the word side in uh, Hebrew is actually... Uh, Hela, and uh, which is supposed to represent, you know, like that Eve is, um, like that Eve is uh, Adam's other half. And see, the thing for me is, I, I have no way to evaluate that argument, but I'm also not sure if you do because I don't think you know very much Hebrew. And that's the kind of thing that gets me is like, you could be right, and you could actually have sources that say that, you know, like sources that are Hebraists and things like that, but. <clears throat> to me, it's sort of one of those things where it's like I, you saying that about the Hebrew uh, word means yeah. as much for me uh, uh, as you know, just some guy who wandered in off the street, and he's like, "Hey, did you know that the Hebrew word for lie is NASA, and that means NASA <laughs> tells lies?" Because I've heard that one too. It's yeah, not I have. So yeah, and I what? So to me, unless you have a working knowledge of classical Hebrew, it's like I don't, uh, I don't know how to evaluate arguments from someone who doesn't speak Hebrew about Hebrew. Well, I can understand where you're coming from, but uh, oh, uh, hold on, Cody wants. So Cody, there was a link in the general uh, chat channel for, or sorry, in the uh, podcast videos and information. So yeah, and on that, that uh, chat channel, the uh, StreamYards link should be in there. I I guess I thought if you sent the StreamYards link directly, but yeah, yeah. if you put uh, I... podcast videos and information. Sorry about but, that. But yeah, but uh, what I was also wanting to say is like that, uh, um, you know, the reason why that I say all that uh, um, is because I have uh, – I have went and looked up, you know, the experts like who actually have, you know, uh, like who actually have studied, yeah, you know, I, the original I, Hebrew text, and, right, like, right. Like, scholars and all that. Right, and that's fair. And in those cases, I would say, you know, like if you were to say that in a video or something, I would expect your citation for that to be in there. Cause, right, like, exactly. Yeah. And um, it's kind of like how when Chris and Al Claire would do some of her, I think that this is Cody. Cody, is that you? Hello. Oh, oh hey. Hey. What's up, Cody? Hello. Welcome. How's it going? Good. Good. Oh, good. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, I don't have a camera. Hey, you know oh, what? Okay. I I actually just got a new camera. One of my uh, fans bought me a camera. Wow. Well, that was, yeah. Nice. That was very nice. I'm gonna I'm gonna be thanking her in um, not the video I'm making now because that's all re-recorded and I don't want to go back and re-record it. But um, I'm gonna put something. <clears throat> uh, thanking her in my next video. But yeah, uh, yesterday I went to go uh, take out my trash and I opened the door and there's a little uh, package from Amazon. I'm like, what's this? I didn't order anything. 
and it says uh, yeah. to the dapper dino, and I'm like, well, that's not normally how I address things to myself. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, sure enough, turns out that uh, it got purchased from my Amazon wish list. So that's really awesome. So nice. Since you're new here, you're, you're a new guest. Introduce, introduce yourself, new guest. Introduce myself. Yeah. Um, I, I'm the same guy as from the debate. So, <laughs> hi. <laughs> But, but my, well, this is my audience, so they might not, not know you. Oh, I, I see, I see. So um, uh, I did a debate with Eric and mm -hmm. his friend Michael, and my name's Cody Sorensen, and um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Well, you also have a, a, a ministry called Spirit Filled Apologetics, or is it a channel? Yeah, yeah, that's um, – well, the YouTube channel is Cody Sorensen, but – Okay. Yeah. So are you trying to make uh, – <clears throat> we'll see. I see Spirit Filled Apologetics. Is that the name of a ministry you'd like to get off the ground or what's, what's the deal? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's basically it. Okay, and I also that... am assuming like that your ministry is something that you recently uh, – I'm assuming that th this is something what you recently decided to start? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I thought so. What's the uh, – is there going to be a particular focus or is this general apologetics or – Um, Basically just – like in the um, about section on the YouTube channel, I just put that I'm defending uh, the reason for the channel is to teach Christian apologetics and defend the Christian faith by accepting the biblical authority of the word of God without reinterpretation or compromise. So it's pretty broad, honestly. Okay. <laughs> I think that'd be what most people would say anyways. But, hey, I mean, that's... That's a perfectly reasonable description. I mean, not everything has to be a laser focused. There's a good reason to have breadth yeah. in your content. I don't want to get too focused. I want to stay broad with it, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I asked Eric what he thought he could have done better. What you, Cody, do you think you could have done better at the debate? Any, any particular part of the debate you could have done better at? Yeah, definitely. But, I'm, but, I'm not going to say, but yeah. <laughs> do I <laughs> show your hands? But I also guess to be fair, you know, um, I can imagine like that probably a lot of I can imagine like that a lot of debaters like would feel that way about every single. Debate oh yeah, that, see, um, all my I thought of a million good responses after the debate, but not <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah that's, that's always how it is. I, I should have said, or I shouldn't have said. Yeah. Yeah. That happens a lot. Yeah. In in fact. My uh, my debate with Ken Hoven after I finished, even though I thought I did really well, there was like about eight or nine points where I was like, oh, I shouldn't have gone here or I should have done this instead. Or yeah. it's the heat you know. of the moment and the pressure, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, and, you know, and that's completely understandable. It's because um, through research I, I have seen and I like that the biggest fear that people have is like to speak in front of a, a, a large Oh yeah, a group yeah. of people, and even though that we technically weren't, it's because we're talking in front of a screen. But at the same time, though, mm -hmm. but at the same time, though, people were watching you, and <coughs> felt that in a way, yeah, you were talking in front of a large amount of people. Yeah, that's why I, I, I didn't ever look at the chat. I do have a question about your debate. Uh, this is just, you're, you did it on uh, you did it on uh, Streamyard too, right? Yeah, with Streamyards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you guys ever think about using like the share screen to like share like notes and like do notes and stuff like visual aids for your debate or just was this talking debate? I thought about it. I thought about sharing pictures, but I didn't really want to accidentally share my notes on the screen. I right. didn't want to be seen, so I just held back from it. And uh, that was kind of the problem that I had. I you know I was trying to figure out a way how I could you know like so. Uh, like uh, slideshows, uh, you know, why I wouldn't be live. I was trying to figure that out, but I just couldn't figure it out. And so, and then that was why I felt like I had to resort to, you know, putting yeah, on yeah. pictures so, on my computer. One thing I can suggest is um, get like a cheap second monitor and then you can screen share from the main monitor yeah. and then you can have things that you would rather not have revealed, like mm -hmm. your debate notes or whatever on the other monitor. And then unless you slide them over to the first monitor you, well, you here's reveal. the problem for me i actually do have i have three monitors but they don't fit on my desk so i can only use one <laughs> so it doesn't <laughs> really works. work 
that's that could be a problem. Well, in that case, it's time for a bigger desk. Yeah, it is. So, but uh, yeah, that that's a problem. I can see that. Um, Excuse me. I guess the only other thing I could think of would be like if you had like a tablet or something, and you could keep like if you had like your your notes or whatever in like a Google Docs or some kind of uh, oh, yeah, cloud-based thing, you could just have them on that, and that way there's even less chance of them showing up on screen. But yeah. I, with one monitor, it's it's tough to make sure that you're screen sharing exactly what you want and not other stuff. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, even every time my desktop absolutely shows up when I'm uh, streaming, and it's not like there's anything embarrassing there. It's just a bunch of games, some pictures, and yeah. a, a background of Godzilla. Like I'm not embarrassed by it. <laughs> But yeah. whenever I accidentally reveal it, I'm like, oh, crap, that's unprofessional. Shouldn't yeah, be I've up. seen some games that they have like three or four monitors. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have. I only have one monitor that I really use for games. The other one usually has like, well, my primary monitor is mostly for games and animating because most of my, or a lot of my videos are fully animated. And uh, the other one tends to be there for other media or reference pictures and stuff like that. Yeah, and I uh, think that you told me what you use for animations in your videos, yeah. but I think I, but I'm just not sure if you told me or not. I can't really. Uh, so I use Blender 3D. Um, it's a free open source. Um, it's a very full featured uh, 3D application. Uh, it has yeah, it has modeling, texturing, uh, physics simulations. It has. Uh, an editing timeline for editing video or audio. It's not great for editing audio, but it don't edit audio in, in Blender. Just, just no, watch. don't do that. It, if you if you need to edit a video that already has the audio figured out, then it's fine. Um, yeah, it's it's a uh, pretty good. I use uh, a render farm called Sheepit, which is a free sort of crowdsourced rendering so solution where there's an executable that you use. And uh, you render whatever frames there are that people need rendered. And each frame that you render gives you points. And then when you need friend frames rendered, each frame that someone else renders for you costs you some of your points. So, okay. Yeah, and that's how I get that done. It's still a fairly involved process. Uh, this video is going to be about 22 hour, hour minutes long. And I think it's going to be, when all is said and done, probably 15, 16 hours of work. Hmm. So, but actually, speaking of the um, Cody, you had brought up the uh, the soft tissue in the Tyrannosaurus. Um, yeah, soft tissue in a lot of dinosaurs. Yeah, well, that actually is going to be a part of my next video because, and this was actually yeah. not planned because of the debate. This was already in the works days beforehand. Mm -hmm. Coincidence. But um, yeah, so I actually have some uh, a friend of mine actually did an on air interview with the uh, the woman who made that discovery in the first place. Yep. And so um, I'm going to be having her her own words from her own mouth as part of that, that video. There's a little two-minute or so slice where she talks about uh, the discovery, what she can and can't say about it in terms of what the data will and won't support, um, as well as uh, things about dating. So, so like so dating walks, not dating, like finding a romance partner. Don't, don't use eHarmony, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... I'll, I'll, or even, uh, or even like Match.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guess you know, I, I'm I uh, guess you can say, it, hey, it wasn't a good match. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and uh, and uh, Dapper, uh, didn't they also find soft tissue in uh, Leonardo? So <clears throat> it's one of the things is. Um, there's a difference between finding soft tissue preservation at all and finding soft tissue where we can do things like get protein sequences. I'm not sure if that recent find involved that, but there are more cases where soft tissue has been permineralized. So for instance, uh, there was that, um, I think it was Borealopelta recently found in Canada. I know it was, an, or I know it was a notosaur, and I think it was Borealopelta, but my uh, my notosaurine memory is not great, but anyway, uh, that had extensive preserved soft tissue, but they were it was permineralized. You couldn't get any original organic material out of it. But then there are also uh, exceptionally unusual circumstances in very high iron content bedding, where uh, there has been the discovery of um, of 
proteins that have been sequenced as well as chemistry consistent with DNA, but we don't currently have the data to say that it is actually 100% for sure DNA or that it's 100% sure from the animal whose bone is preserved. So uh, it's, yeah. Okay. Nice. I have a question about the debate real fast. Uh, so whose idea was it and how did you find or pick your opponent? Well, what happened was um, after when I re uh, sorry, when I re-uploaded the, my, debate with Ken Hovind on my channel, I um, I can probably safely assume like that Cody typed in a uh, Ken Hovind debate or something on YouTube and then he came across mine and then he left me a comment saying that he wished that he debated me and, I, and I'm like, well, if you want to have your, your chance, we, you know, if you want to have your, your chance, we certainly can arrange that. Yep. If I was so, like, I wish I could have debated you. Because I didn't think Kent Hovind did very good. He usually doesn't. Um, and so, um, and so Cody, I could probably safely assume that you found my debate, but like by typing in Kent Hovind d d debate or something like that. Yeah, I found it on his channel when I typed in Kent Hovind debate. I saw it on his channel, or no, it was on his channel or yours? I don't. But I, I don't think he ever re-uploaded it on his. Um, I know it was. On, it was originally on praise, uh, praise that I am or something like oh, praise that. Yeah. I am that I am. Yeah, um, it you know like that that channel has a a name that just rolls right off my tongue. Yeah, you know? I, I get why it's named that, but like uh, it's not, it's it's not the most wonderful name in terms of like yeah. comprehension. And, and, did, yeah, and did yeah, you ask did you ask Dapper Dino to be the moderator or did he volunteer? Um, so, um, I believe you asked on Twitter, right? Uh, yeah, I believe I asked you on Twitter. And so originally I, originally I asked Michael to be the moderator, but then Michael said he really didn't know what to do. And, um, I mean, since my friend Michael's very passionate about his projects and, you know, Michael and I have been good friends for about a year now, I, you know, I just wanted to be a good friend. And I just kind of thought that, you know, maybe like that. You know him debating with me and like would bring exposure to his projects and so yeah i i mean it kind of sucks by the fact that you know like that the tech nickel side didn't work on his part yeah that was frustrating oh yeah, was. i really liked michael's questions too but mm -hmm. oh well yeah it I, that's one of those things where maybe next time if michael's going to come on something there needs to be like a the previous day iron out technical stuff yeah yeah i uh, yeah, even yeah. i i had a little trouble technical trouble at first um i'm on my laptop right now because my desktop just wouldn't connect to Streamyard properly like at all do what you gotta do <laughs> yeah so yeah. i'm like whatever i'm gonna go grab my laptop up yeah my last room yeah my last two uh, things with tony reed he had to use his cell phone for, for stream yards because his computer broke so he was oh. always looking he was always glitching in and out and he um, eric problems. was there he had some problems mm -hmm. with his um his debate with Kent Hovind, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My, I mean, you know, that whole debate, like, uh, like, like, I guess pretty much delayed, I guess you could put it, or put off or whatever, like for half an hour, more at least around there, because of all the tech, you know, problems. And, uh, oh, and Joseph Grants, um, from my understanding, and it's been a while since I looked at the paper on this, uh, that, the proteins that were found in the T-Rex femur were collagens and they were sequenced. Now, one thing is protein sequences aren't as useful as DNA sequences because uh, multiple codons will code for the same amino acid. And so you cannot get a one-to-one -one, um, DNA sequence from a protein sequence, even though you can always get the protein sequence from a DNA sequence, sort of a one-way th thing. But uh, they were compared to uh, the proteins of living diapsids, and they were closest to birds and next closest to crocodilians, which is what would have been expected according to the birds or dinosaurs uh, taxonomy. Yeah, and also, um, and um, I mean, with Schweitzer's original to discovery um they actually found like that the collagen in it is identical to ostrich 
collagen too. I hadn't heard that it was identical, although it wouldn't. Oh, oh well, me. um, maybe not a hundred percent, or or at least like ninety eight or ninety percent. You know, pretty close to it. Yeah, and also, um, Mary Schweitzer, as far as I know, still has not made the claim that the the round red structures are definitely uh, red blood cells, but they are morphologically consistent with uh, archosaur blood cells from living archosaurs. Yeah, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong from my understanding, uh, uh, she actually found like preserved HEBA, globin and not blood cells. Well, she found heme groups, which mm -hmm. is one of the constituents of hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. So, um, Heme, glu heme groups are a part of the oxygen transport chemistry, and they're not quite the entirety of hemoglobin, but hemoglobin is composed of heme groups. Mm -hmm. um, a heme group, a he hemoglobin itself is not the sturdiest of molecules, but mm -hmm. the heme groups that can help make it up are more robust. So it's not too surprising that uh, hemoglobin itself wasn't actually found. Right, and uh, when I was on the, the phone with her a um, little, little bit over a year ago. Uh, she also even brought up and like that um, there actually were some people like who um, who assumed and I can uh, and I can understand why um, picking like that. Oh, she found you know this from a T Rex um, and so then that might mean it's a possibility. Then you know he can pull a Jurassic Park and bring back a T Rex. But unfortunately, you know, just they're just. There just wasn't anything to work off of, you know. Man, that the discovery for that. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, Cody, what was the name of the article about a Cretaceous rabbit? Do you remember that? It wasn't. It, actually, it wasn't. It was a video um, by Creation Magazine Live, and they were going over all the animals that supposedly were mistakenly dated to be you know millions of years old like a rabbit i could just send you the video if you'd like like a link to the video uh yeah that would be great or uh you can yeah, send it i just i was just actually gonna email it to you today but oh, okay if... well, that would be cool because <laughs> um actually who was it i was i don't remember who it was but it was so it was a viewer sent me a comment about um said something like oh there were there was a rodent found in supposedly Cretaceous soil, and I said, well, yeah, that's, you know, Gleer's diverged from Archontans about in the sort of the middle period of the Cretaceous, even though the Cretaceous is only divided into late, early and late, which I hate, but, um, and then, you know, rodents diverged from Gleer's at, towards the end of the Cretaceous, so that's, that's pretty much when I would expect you to start seeing rodents in the fossil record based on both the fossils as well as molecular studies. So uh, I don't know. I think one of the things is that um, I think people don't understand the timeline that is proposed by evolutionary biology for uh, mammal evolution. Like I feel like a lot of people have this idea that according to the theory of evolution, mammals started 66 million years ago the dinosaurs died and then mammals appear, but that's not true. In fact, uh, a lot of the very early divergence of mammals happened towards the later part of the Mesozoic, like um, the split between uh, Lorisotherians and the rest of mammals, which includes like the Afrotheres and stuff that happened in the Jurassic. And then, um, you know, bats were around during the end Cretaceous. So at one sure. point there were three lines of flying uh, tetrapods Lying around the air. So, so I, I, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so you've been, have you been watching the Aaron Ra's video, this the line thing? The, the, uh, the systematic classification of life? Yeah, the 20 videos yeah, of he's, mammals. I think he's on something like 23, and he's only now getting up to Hominini. And I think his first video included something like six clades. So if he'd taken a video per clade, it would have, he'd still be somewhere around like theriaforms or something. So yeah, it's it's certainly an interesting uh, video series. And I also appreciate the giving the anatomical traits associated with, with each clade that he's going through is nice. Yeah. yeah, I did not realize until I watched that 
the, the scientists that there are so many lines between just like the the amio split and mammals themselves that like the, 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 the i knew about side and stuff like that but how many different little individual oh, yeah. things there were or, or between uh what else was there yeah, a lot of different things. I had no idea how, how vast it was. And well, actually, that that uh, phylogenetics and cladistics thing is actually – it's something that I'm always curious what the creationist take is on it. So actually um, – so, Cody, would you – you would say that there are – like perhaps all of the equines or the canids would be related to each other and maybe that – like Explain saying, me no, what those uh, are, and I'll give you an oh, answer. <laughs> the, the equids, uh, equidae is the family that includes uh, horses, zebras, donkeys, as well yeah, as... Yeah, they're all related. Species. Okay. And, like, maybe all they're the, the canids, same, which would be, like, all the same horses, sort. Or, yeah. And then maybe all the canids, like uh, foxes and uh, dogs and jackals and... Yep, they're all related because they're also the same sort. Okay. But where, where do you cut that off? Are horses and rhinos related to each other? No, can they mate and produce offspring? Well, not all dogs can do that either, or all canids can do that. No, but my point is, can a can a rhino mate with a horse and produce offspring? Well, no, but you. So does that mean that foxes and uh, the African painted dog aren't the same sort? Because they can't either. Well, I, I'm I'm not sure. Neither can I've a never... and a chihuahua. Yeah, well, also, they're genetically compatible. I, I, I mean, yeah. they're not going to do it, but what I'm saying is genetically, can if they can genetically do it, they're the same. Well, okay, it's it's more about baromenology, and that's a whole like whole study within itself. And so it basically comes down to how did the ancients classify animals? And some of it was very similar to how we do it today. Of course, they didn't believe in evolution and all these ideas, so it's there's a lot of differences, obviously, but... From, um, and from what baromenology shows is that basically they would classify animals how, kind of how we have canine, feline, you know what I mean? Just the basic family classifications. So what about groups where within a family... So I guess my, my question then is there are most families of animals include genetically incompatible species. Well, yeah, of course that's going to happen. So they're so distant in species. I'm not saying that you defined a sort specifically by it. can they mate and produce offspring. I think that's just one of the main factors, though. Oh, Lamont where? left. Lamont, if that's... he leaves, does our stream end? No, oh, I, was, I, was, I was just going to get a, a drink. I was going to be off. I was going to oh, okay. drink water. I don't want to be off. No, no. Worry. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We, we were a little worried there. <laughs> so, yep. yeah, I was like, are you all right? <laughs> so then I guess the question then would be, okay, well, if that means that your reason for why rhinoceros and the rhinoceros and the horse aren't in the same kind, it's very, it it's very, very self-evident that a, a rhino and a horse are nowhere near the same family See, of animal. I would agree that they're very distant if you only look at modern forms, but there are fossil horses and fossil rhinoceros that look almost identical, except for details of the dentition that I can barely even notice. And the only other big difference that I can see in the fossil forms of rhinoceros and horses are horses tend to have longer nasal bones. So okay. what about those animals? where it's, there are places where it takes an expert. And yep. I mean, someone who spends. Oh, I know that's the, that's what the study. That's, that's, I know that's what the study of trying to figure out how to classify animals, because sometimes it's really, really difficult. Like how do you classify a platypus? <laughs> Good luck. You know, I mean, obviously oh, they uh, do, but it's, it's not sure easy. That. It's a, it's a monitor. I know it has been what I'm saying. It's, it's difficult because what is this animal, you know, but I'm saying there's the whole study of classifying animals. I'm not saying that it's super easy to tell. What I'm saying is that um, all the species of canine and dogs all in the world came from two, two ancestors. Right. But the and reason that I'm I saying that it seems like the reason you're saying that is because they tend to be very similar animals. 
So well, the reason I'm saying that is based on Genesis. So, Cody, do you think that horses, rhino, you, they, you know, they, they, you think, do you think horses, rhinos, and humans, and all of them are, are, are all animals or, or mammals themselves? They're all animals. Well, humans, I wouldn't say are directly animals. I mean, technically, but not biblically. We're very what different. Mean, what does that mean, technically? Technically, if you were just to get someone to just look at, like, someone that's completely ignorant with everything, they would probably say that humans were just an advanced animal. But biblically, humans are not animals. They have dominion over animals, but they have a spirit which no animal actually has plants have plants are just biological machines they don't have a soul animals have a soul but they don't have a spirit people have a soul and a spirit and they are made in the image of god so they're very different from animals but scientifically just trying to classify well i guess you would say even christians i would say humans are kind of animals you know i, I think you might have gotten the soul and spirit swapped there no no animals um Animals do not have a spirit because they don't go anywhere when they die. A spirit is what where you go is what is you that goes to the afterlife. According I thought, to, that, was, I thought that was the soul that went to the afterlife. No, no, no. A lot of people don't understand the difference between a soul and a spirit, and they're not the same thing either. A soul is like personality, like you, like kind of like what you think of someone when you're thinking about them. Like it's really the soul, but the spirit is you like what happens to you when you die like where you go your spirit goes to heaven and everyone mixes up they think it's soul it's not the way it is you know what i mean well the reason i say that is because the word spirit is usually uh used to trans actually it even in latin and it's it's ultimate derivation including where it's used to translate is usually things with to do with the breath of life which is a term that the bible uses and the word spirit itself comes from the same root as respiration and aspiration. I mean, the New Testament makes it clear there's a difference between soul and spirit. So, I agree. I just yeah. feel like we might be mixing those two up. But then again, I'm not really an expert on that matter either. And I don't yeah. really care which one is which. Is uh, Sorry to barge in, but uh, Joseph Grant left a comment saying that this this. Uh, Discussion's going way off track, and he said good night. And I kind of think that 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 implies that he left. Oh well. So I uh, I didn't realize there was a specific topic. Yeah, I didn't either. I thought it was we were going to hang out after the debate and chat about yeah. stuff. So, uh, uh, but I mean, yeah, if it's not uh, interesting I, to you, then thinking that he said that probably because he was expecting we were going to be talking about the debate itself. I mean, the debate. I thought I this kind of was. Uh, to, to some extent, the debate can kind of stand on its own, and I, I feel like you know this is a chance to talk about things that, in a less formal setting, that have to do with the topics around the debate, and I think this is this is still that. But yeah. um, so, I also, Cody, there so. was something there was something you said. And it was the reason that you said that these things were related was Genesis. But the thing is, no one's going to be able to read Genesis and then go out into the world and on the basis of no other evidence than looking around and holding Genesis in front of them, determine whether the African painted dog and the maned wolf and the gray I didn't wolf say we determined, I didn't say we classify animals based on Genesis. I said that because of Genesis, I know that all of there's all canines are from two dogs. That's my point. But baromenology and how the ancient way that they would classify animal or modern is its own thing. I'm not saying we use Genesis to classify animals. I'm saying I believe that animals are don't come from are not all related because of Genesis. Right. And what my question is, as I'm trying to understand what it is that is the reason that you would say, okay, canids are their own kind of of animal, but borophagines, which differ from canids basically only in a few minor ways having to do with the jaw and ear aren't and why horses would be a kind and rhinos would be a different kind even though some examples of these animals are so close to each other that it takes 
decades of study to figure out which one is which. And so yep. I don't understand what the reasoning is behind where you pick that line. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Because if you just take modern animals, you can kind of just lump them into a few categories. But if we take into account all of the animals that we have evidence of, it becomes a little bit tougher. And it's not easy to see why, why is it that rhinos are one group and horses are another, even though there are horses and rhinos that are almost identical to each other and look more like each other. What than, are you talking about? Are you unaware of the fossil record for equids and rhinoceros today? Well, if are you talking about like, like a theory of what they would look like if they were related or oh, like taking actually the bones, found? taking the bones and figuring out, okay, I have a, a dentary bone. I know it's the dentary bone of a parasodactyl, but I don't know if it's the dentary bone of a rhino or a horse. They're both the same size. They both have molars used for grind grinding plants. And the only way I can distinguish them, and this is a real world problem that happens in actual paleontology, is that you have to go in and do things like <clears throat> carefully measure the molar cusps and count up the cusps very carefully and sort through them. Because at in the smaller, and I know you would dispute the dating, but according to the mainstream dating methods, earliest horses and rhinos, are their fossils are essentially identical. The only differences are in the teeth and the nasal bone. They're both three hoofed ungulates that have, carry the majority of the weight on the middle hoof, which is, I think it's digit three, but I would have to double check. They both are about the size of a large house cat or a small dog. Well, a little bit bigger than that, but still. I mean, they both have the same everything. The only distinguishing feature is slight differences in the shape of the molars. And so I don't know why it is that we can say, oh, this group clearly couldn't be the same group because they're so different now. I didn't say they could cl clearly. I, again, I never said it was obvious. This is why we have to do a deep study about it. They've been doing this for thousands of years. Okay. And they do it very differently. The way they did it then was very differently than it is today. I mean, right. do you ever think maybe that what you're describing in the fossils, if it exists, I'm not even sure. I'm not saying you're lying. I'm saying I think what you're saying is actually just theories of what could exist based on evolution. But what I'm saying is that that maybe what you're describing in these fossils is actually a whole other kind within itself, and they're just not under. They don't understand it because it's extinct, and maybe it was alive. Um, only thousands of years ago, but it went extinct and it died in a flood and it was deposited into fossils. So it's a kind that didn't make it on the Ark? What's... No, a kind that could have made it on the Ark. I'm saying it probably could be a different species or something we just don't understand. It doesn't necessarily mean, therefore, it's it's <laughs> therefore it's the ancestor of a horse and a rhino. I think that's a I'm not even making the claim conclusion. I'm not even making the claim that it's the ancestor of the horse or the rhino. I'm just saying but that your whole thing is that well we see that in the fossils that rhinos and horses are so similar we can barely tell the difference. Therefore, how do you know what a kind is? What I'm saying is how do you know that that's the ancestor of those two animals to begin with? I'm not making you're, the claim that it is. You literally made the claim that because I can't you're saying that I can't how can you know um, what a kind is if we don't if if we see in the fossil record that apparently these animals are so similar there's no way to tell what a kind is well my my point is if we're going to say that similar animals because we've already said that just breeding isn't enough because we yeah, it's not enough right so it, I can accept if they can breed, then they would have to be the same kind. Okay. Yep. But we also have examples where most people who are creationists say, well, these animals that can't breed are still in the same kind anyway. So that means that breeding yep. can't be our determiner. It's Yeah, it's not the determiner, but it's a big indicator. It really helps. Right, it does. But in cases where there's no breeding, you have to go with some kind of similarity. Yeah, so so Cody, what's your opinion on this on like similarity again? But the the similarity of the DNA, how close some, some things are to each other. Well, that's pretty obvious. See, DNA, what DNA shows is that um, it shows when you see similarities in DNA, for some reason people make the assumption, well, then they're related. But no, the reason that there's similarities is because there would have to be similarities. That's how code works. And of course, code 
shows intelligent designer in my opinion but that's another topic but um so when you have similarities for example a chimpanzee and a or ape and a human well of course based on how they're built they're gonna have to have similar code or similar dna it would have to be that way but it doesn't mean that they must be related therefore it's not really it's because same designer designed like here's a really cliche generic um overused yeah. um example but powerpoint has code microsoft word has code they're coded by in general the same people and they have very very similar code but it does not mean that therefore they're related to each other they came from the same designers so cody i have a question do you have you ever heard of the protein preston yeah I, I'm not super, super educated on that stuff, but I've heard of this. So Preston is a protein that's used to facilitate echolocation in both bats and cetaceans. Well, microcoroptera, since megacoroptera has no... So I think you're going to say because they both have that, they must be related. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> if you do, a, you know, uh, you know what a protein sequence is. It's basically just a protein is mm -hmm. essentially a line of amino acids. And if you write mm -hmm. them all down, that's the protein sequence, right? Yep. So if you do a protein sequence for Preston in both bats and cetaceans, it comes out to be essentially identical. Okay. Actually, no, it's 100% identical if I remember correctly. But if you look at the neutral variation in the DNA, because as a result of the fact that each codon can, or sorry, each amino acid is uh, coded for by multiple codons. And as a general rule of thumb, the middle uh, base pair in a codon doesn't actually affect which amino acid is used. It's essentially a spacer. So if you look at that neutral variation where it can't actually affect the proteins or yeah, the protein sequence, there is essentially no similarity between the gene for Preston in uh, chiropterans and the gene in Preston in cetaceans. So why is it that in places where we can say, okay, well, they need this protein to be functional to survive, and that's a good reason why they're they have this genetic similarity, okay. But why is there this big lack of genetic similarity in the neutral variation? But on the other hand, there isn't that similar lack of variability in the neutral um, parts of the genetic code when you say just restrict it to, if you look at only chiropterans. If you look at all the chiropterans, they all have very similar neutral variation in that gene. And if you look at all the cetaceans, they also have very similar neutral variation for that gene. But when you look across, there's essentially no similarity. How does this, how is this a problem for me though? Well, because I would expect if there's two options, if God is simply copy pasting genetic code because similar design, similar code, similar design or similar code, then I would expect all animals to either have for the same gene, either similar or non-similar neutral variation across the board without any particular statistical groupings within smaller groups. Okay. And? So, <laughs> and that's not what happens. The statistical distribution of neutral variation strongly contradicts the possibility of separate descent for neutral variation in genes. Because it's true. If you're looking at functional genes that are coding for proteins that various organisms need, there's a strong conservation bias to keep those things the same. It's why you can look at um, genes that are universal invertebrates. And almost every vertebrate has a nearly identical copy of this gene because it's vital for, for uh, life to continue. Mutations that are functional mutations to, this, to these genes are very detrimental. So they, they don't persist. I, I have a question for you then. Okay. So how does, how does code evolve over time? Because code needs intelligence. Pretty simple, but I'd expect an answer. Well, so DNA is only a code by analogy. DNA is, in fact, a molecule. And it's a molecule that we know yeah. when it reproduces can change. And the fact is, unlike computer codes or most ciphers or things, there is a large number of mutations which will still result in something that can be sequenced during protein sequencing. You can change a gene very significantly and still leave it as something that can be sequenced. So the genetic quote unquote cob or code, can't even talk, code is really not very analogous to computer codes or human language codes. 
And so it can develop over time simply because we've observed it doing so. It's, it's not a hypothetical thing. This is a thing that occurs. De novo gene production. So the code, the I'm not that. saying that we can't observe it changing, but so we, so you think that we have, well, I know, I, you never said this, but do you think that code or DNA started from very, very, very incredibly simple to what it is now all on, on, all on its own by, by chance over millions of years? Well, no, I think the most likely explanation is that uh, RNA, which can spontaneously self-assemble, that's a thing that has so also you do been think it, so, it so it all came together by chance over millions millions of years. Um, evolution does um, evolution d does not uh, say at all whether or not if it was by chance. It does not say that at all. I would. That's true. And also, all known all current hypotheses for abiogenesis do not involve it being a chance process. The and, I'm sorry. Yeah. So DNA in general, though, it is chance because if you don't believe anyone put it there, why is it there? And to have it be the way it is, it's only chance. Not not having been put someplace by a person is not the same as chance. No, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that just the fact that there is DNA the way it is now, without any sort of design, and to have it build up to be bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more complex over time. There is obviously the possibility that, well, it's not going to happen, but I'm just saying that right. it is indeed chance. <laughs> when, when predicting something like that in the future, it's certainly uh, statistical estimates of likelihood are useful. But the fact is that as something is happening in the physical world, if it's basically at the scale of molecules or bigger, it's not a chance phenomenon. It is governed by very non-chance laws of physics and chemistry. But see, so you guys here, all of you, think that, that code can essentially create itself with well, no like initial said, cause. DNA is not itself actually... I know it's not an code. actual code, but it is indeed code Well, in it general. currently codes for things, but when... And DNA... I will try to finish the thing that I had started earlier, which is to say that RNA can self-assemble and RNA can both catalyze its own reproduction as well as catalyze the formation of DNA. And so the most likely scenario currently is that RNA self-assembled and then because it can catalyze its own reproduction and it can also catalyze protein synthesis on its own, it's very inefficient at it compared to say a ribosome, but there's a reason that the center of every ribosome is a small piece of RNA. So from, because, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Take over. Uh, and from my understanding of RNA from the research I have done, um, uh, um, it's, um, it's the um, RNA world hypothesis. Um, they're not sure 100% for sure if it is RNA, but, but at the same time, though, uh, scientists are just saying like that it, it's the most likely c candidate. For it, it's from my understanding, it's because that they find a lot of like RNA cells in every single living uh, creature, and so and then that's why that they say that is the most likely candidate. And uh, with me uh, being a uh, a theist and uh, and uh, and whatnot, I don't have a problem with learning about RNA or, or any of that. It's because of the fact that you know. Just with me as a theist, it's uh, just that, you know, I just don't see any problem like with the fact and like that, you know, and like that God could have been the one to start all that, you know, kind of like what I said during the debate, you know, um, you know, um, God can, uh, you know, God can create the universe any way that he wants to. And, and I also understand and like that Cody's not going to agree and th that's fine, too. Yeah, think about. I was think of RNA and DNA. As the, I was studying it, you know, it's like there's only one letter differences. Like three of the letters in both DNA and RNA are the same. There's only one different letter. I forget what letter it is, but only one. Like there's only one well, letter that's different. In terms of the base pairs for RNA and DNA, that's true. But the um, the the so-called uh, sides of the letters, as opposed to the rung, if we're going to use the ladder analogy, uh, have a different chemical basis. Uh, RNA is less stable than DNA, and um, it's it's generally the, the biggest difference is that it's less robust, but it also, unlike DNA, can catalyze its own uh, replication as well as catalyze protein synthesis, 
which is why the RNA world hypothesis seems to be a pretty good hypothesis. Also, uh, RNA can catalyze the formation of DNA, which is based on the code already there in the RNA. So because RNA molecules can self-assemble, in which case, at which point they would have an essentially random set of base pairs, they can then, using those base pairs, catalyze protein synthesis. And if some of the RNA happens to uh, synthesize proteins that help the RNA do better at making more RNA, then you have the start of an evolutionary process. And then eventually, if you have a system where RNA can be real reasonably enclosed in some sort of stable environment that can maintain itself outside of thermodynamic equilibrium for the short term at least, then you can do things like get DNA synthesis inside that system, which will then allow for uh, the DNA to take over the function of storing genetic uh, material for later reproduction. And then the RNA simply becomes what it is now, essentially a messenger and a DNA duplication enhancer. And so, yeah, that's, that's sort of the basis of the RNA world hypothesis sort of taken down to a very simple level. So the answer is the quote unquote code would actually have pre-existed DNA because it would have been in RNA, which only later then would have synthesized DNA based on the pre-existing base pairs in the RNA. And RNA base pairs do come into existence spontaneously without the need for any um, living organisms to create them. Oh, so, was that to me? Well, that was just in general the idea behind how it is the genetic material. And I'll use the word code because even though it's not super accurate, it's it's way easier than saying a full long explanation. And that is how the genetic code can start out initially. And after it does, then different differential ability to pr reproduce or to survive to reproduce will allow beneficial changes to accumulate. And of course, since these systems would have had fairly low resistance to lateral gene, gene transfer, since, I mean, they wouldn't have had time to develop such things, um, things that are beneficial can spread quickly throughout any given population of organisms, even that are distantly related. Because initially, it seems like life probably had a very low resistance to lateral gene transfer, or horizontal gene transfer, as it's also called. Is that, is that that's when pro, prokaryotes transfer genes. Well, it doesn't right? just happen with prokaryotes. Um, actually, uh, so a significant part of your genome as a human is actually uh, has its origins in retroviruses. Oh, yeah. So in fact, actually, um, it's been reasonably well established that um, the genes encoding for uh, uh, metatheri or not metatheri, but um, placental, uh, the placenta in placental mammals, yeah, actually, I remember, heard, genes actually originated as part of a retroviral insertion into the genome. I heard about that. Yeah. So it's it's not just to do with prokaryotes, although that's the place where it happens the most frequently is in prokaryotes. But yeah, um, there's also, um, there's a butterfly species that has taken bits of the DNA of a fungal parasite, actually a parasitoid fungus, that infects the caterpillars and have been able to use that to help uh, increase their resistance to that fungal parasite. So lateral gene transfer does happen. It's not very common and it gets less common as you get um, multicellular life, but it's still a thing that happens. Or it's also possible that when creating a butterfly the creator copy pasted fungus DNA into one species of butterfly, but not others. Yep. That's also possible. I mean, that's how, and that's when then natural selection takes its course. So then what can survive survives, but whatever didn't have it pre existing in it will not survive. Right. But then we also have mechanisms for horizontal gene transfer. So. It's one of those things where it's like, at a certain point, the, the natural world looks so much like one that evolved that if we're going to seriously entertain the idea that it didn't, we have to invoke a deity who is essentially tricking people.
Not necessarily. Uh, yeah, it really is, though, because... Well, how do you know everything evolved? I Well, it depends on what you mean by no. Oh, sorry, Eric, no. You're, you're quiet. Uh, oh, that's oh, all I... uh, good. It was, uh, you know, it was uh, just that you all like were uh, talking, and I didn't want to... Oh, no, I, I just meant you were audibly quiet when you said something. Polite. Uh, I do what? have a question for Cody O. So, a two-part question, actually. So, so you believe in a literal 6,000 old Earth? Yeah, just about Don't that. Hunger? So, evolution aside and stuff, how, how do you explain the, like, like Native Americans crossed, they, they, historically, they say Native Americans crossed the land bridge 10,000 years ago, or, or, and like, there's settlements of North America way back then. So how do you well, I guess explain that? My question would be to you, how do you know that? Archaeology? Yeah, but how do you know maybe it wasn't actually as long ago as people think? I question you. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not an archaeologist. Okay, well that's a cop-out. <laughs> so I think that, yes, the world is about six to 7,000 years old. Answer your question. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I would say is that there are, in fact, numerous archaeological dating methods which tend to yeah. do a pretty good job of cross-confirming each other. So there are things like... Um, it's all based on assumptions. That's, yeah. that's called historical science. That's not observational science. There is no one outside of creationist pseudoscience groups that makes that distinction. Yes, I know, because they don't like that. <laughs> no, because there isn't a distinction. There is. There, there are really things you can well. observe, and there are things you cannot observe. Yes. You have to assume. And I and I can observe. They're things. assuming the date. No. Of yes, they're they are. They are absolutely because they don't know if their dating methods are accurate. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. How, okay, they do Eric. Process. Okay, Eric. Eric, how mm -hmm. do they know that these Native Americans were really there that long ago? Well, like I said during the debate, there are there are multiple different dating methods. You just have to yep. use the, you 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 just have to use the correct one, like for like a certain layer and whatnot. And so, man, so say for an example, I'm going to say I weigh. For an example, I, I say I'm going to say that I weigh 200 pounds. Well, and then after that, I had experiment weigh myself and all these different machines. And, and if I get the same result, like which intertwine with each other, they all say um, that I'm 200 pounds. I then can be confident in that. Yep, that's observable okay. science. Ten thousand years ago is not observable. That's historical. Uh, yes, it is. Um, you cannot observe ten thousand years ago. Like I said in the debate, get a laser beam and point it to the moon last Tuesday. You can't because last Tuesday was last Tuesday. It's the past. We can only observe what we see now. And I know they say, oh, well, starlight, we're seeing into the past. Well, we're still seeing only one time period. It's not like we get to see like T1. There's T1, T2. We're only seeing T1 in that case. But for most cases, what we're observing is T2. So still, you cannot look into the past. I know they don't like this. You're only making assumptions. And even if your assumptions are correct, you don't know if your assumptions are correct. They're only assumptions. There's a huge difference between what we observe and what we think is right. It's only based on theories. So you're right. There are only assumptions. And one of the biggest yes, assumptions, there are assumptions is that the, is simply the assumption of science, that the laws of physics are not going to vary greatly across time. That is the yeah. only big assumption. And in fact, it's no longer just an assumption because now we can observe various periods of time uh, astrolog How astrologically. Do you, no, you're only seeing one time. No, we're you're seeing not many seeing, times. Because you're not seeing the present it, because you're looking into the past. But then again, you're not seeing what the past has done now in the future or in the present. Do you see how it, seeing, there's no way out of it? Yes. Okay. I'm going to try this again. Because astronomy looks at things of very different distances, each of which would have required the light to travel a different amount of time, by looking in different places, we can see structures in the universe from different times. And in every case, all of the observable laws of physics that we can get from that are temporally consistent. 
There is yes, no I agree. time change there. That is the one assumption of science that we can't actually really provide much evidence for. But in fact, we actually now do have a whole bunch of evidence for it, even though it's still a fairly big assumption. But the thing is, if that assumption weren't true, science just wouldn't work. We wouldn't be able to develop technology. We wouldn't be able to if develop that assumption medicine, wasn't true. The assumption that the rules of physics are essentially consistent. I, I never said they weren't. <laughs> but that is what is required by creationism. No, it's, creationism it's not. It requires the laws of physics to have been broken repeatedly. In what place? Well, just the flood, for example. The flood? Yeah. How does that go against the laws of physics? Um, I mean, it goes against the laws of hydrology, geology. There no, isn't it, actually enough water existing on Earth. Yeah, paleontology. Um, it goes okay, against. But the give me no, no. That's, that's way, way too broad. You're saying, oh, that's like saying, oh, it just goes against science. Tell me, it how does. does it specifically? No, there. Okay, no. It, there has been enough means time you, in the past four thousand years for the genetic diversity of all the various quote kinds that we there still absolutely can't has been. Recover. There's been enough in two hundred years for just for enough what we see in the canines. There absolutely, no. Yes, there absolutely has, and we're not. We're talking for about the more four thousand. Yes, for four thousand years. Though. There's absolutely enough time. No, not there's enough time to get that amount of morphological diversity from organisms starting with a pair but there isn't enough time to get the genetic diversity that's going with it because most of the genetic diversity that exists in life doesn't show up as gross morphological features. Yeah. If you look at two animals that are almost identical, so if you look at any two gray wolves from the world, they're almost certainly much more genetically distinct than you are from any other human because humans have an unusually low amount of genetic diversity as a species. But we still have so much genetic diversity that current mutation rates couldn't possibly account for that much genetic diversity from essentially six reproducing pairs, half of which it, we're, we're talking we're about siblings. four thousand years. It's, it is plenty of time for the speciation. Is absolutely enough time. There, it's not any scientist will say, "Oh yeah, it is enough time." It's it, enough time if, for that number of species to occur. It is not enough time to accumulate the current number of alleles in all of the populations that we have extant. How do you know? Because don't just, current well, don't. mutation rates are well studied in numerous lines of organisms and they do not lead you back. Because if we assume unclean animals, so we're only taking a pair, a male and a female, and we assume absolute complete heterozygosity for every allele, we're still only starting with four alleles per gene per group of organisms that are a so-called kind, if you go with observable rates of mutation, they would have had to have been exponentially larger to get the current amount of genetic diversity in 4,000 years. It simply doesn't follow the laws of science because it requires that genetics have worked very differently in the past. But oh, once we can look at it, once we can see it, now it doesn't work that way anymore. That is fundamentally pseudoscientific and anti-science. That is why the believing in a literal global flood 4,000 years ago is contrary to science. And that is not the only case where it's like that. It's like that across the board. Every single thing that we could look at and we would say, if there were a global flood, I would expect X. Instead, we find not X. Okay. So what would we expect to find from a global flood at any time period, as long as there's life? We'd find uh, we'd find th we'd find hundreds of sedimentary layers with fossils deposited into the layers. Yes. What do we find in the world? Layers, what so what we find in the world? What do we find? We, we find, find all these all these sedimentary layers without erosion marks. And what do we find in them? We find well, we find these dead fossilized creatures all deposited into it. It kind of seems more like a flood. Even even a lot of scientists are well aware of this, so they say, well, it was just a bunch of local floods. I'm not talking about Christians. I mean. People are just, they, they're trying to figure it out on their own. You know they think they it was a bunch of local, local floods. Flood as such? <sighs> what? Do you know? How, you, how does a geologist look at a place and say, this, is, this, this layer in the rock is the result of a flood? Because they see, they see differences in layers that it's, it's sedimentary particles yes, sorted. Specifically, why do they say this is a flood layer? Because it's... It's obvious. It was obviously formed by water. <laughs> well, that's a large number of sediments. But the uh, reason that geologists say that this particular layer is from a flood is because floods leave behind graded bedding. 
That's the only kind of strata that floods have ever been observed laying down. They don't lay down evaporites. They don't lay down aeolian sandstone. They don't lay down schist. They don't lay down shale. They don't lay down siltstone. They don't lay down limestone. They don't lie down, lay down, yeah, lay down any of these things. They only have ever been observed laying down graded bedding. And when we find graded bedding in the geological column, it's consistent with graded bedding formed by floods now. So if there had been a global flood, the obvious expectation and requirement according to geography or geology is that there be a relatively consistent worldwide layer of graded bedding or several layers which represent a flood of global proportions. There is no such layer and many of the layers that are fossil bearing could not have formed in a flood or even underwater. Do you know what an evaporite is? It's things like salt mines. Salt doesn't mm -hmm. just precipitate into thick layers underneath water. It's called an evaporite because it forms as water evaporates, leaving the non-volatile components of the solution behind. Okay, so what would be your... ...of these fossil-bearing strata that are supposedly evidence for the flood. Okay, so what would, what would be your... Another one of your theories for um, for the lack of erosion marks. There, first, there are erosion marks. It's simply not true that there are none. Second, the okay. fact that un, and, I'd like to see that. Well, that's one of the problems. What does it look like to have an erosion mark? If you're looking at it from a cutaway of stone, which is what most people can see when they go to see strata in places like the Grand Canyon or similar places. Not that. That's like outside the layers. I mean, like within the layers, you see erosion, like intersect. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about like yeah. just land erosion. I mean like within the strata layers, yeah, so you can have, see that. We have ancient stream beds. That is erosion. No, no, no. I want to see where, where there are a bunch of layers that have individual er erosion marks within the layers itself, proving that they're time periods and not formed by water. I mean, look at any Aeolian sandstone deposit. They all have ridge marks that are the result of wind erosion eroding away. Do you know? Okay. okay. Never that's, mind. Act, that's one of the that's one of the actual ways that you can tell that a sandstone happens to be Aeolian sandstone is because it has characteristic cross threading as a result of wind erosion. Again, it's it's all you. I'm not, never mind. I shouldn't say that, but like again, all these things you these are all still you're missing the my, the bigger picture is it's all based on assumptions and assuming. No, it's not. No, it's not. It I'm is absolutely. Every kind of rock that has been laid down, with the exception of very few igneous rocks from the very lowest layers, can be observed forming right now. It is not an assumption to say that the process that formed, and in many cases, we understand the physics but of how these rocks are formed. No one ever, well. ever, no one ever saw these rocks forming. Yeah, and no one ever saw that car in the that is now in the ditch with the tire marks on the road actually drive into the ditch because now the driver is dead. But you know what? I still think it's a reasonable assumption based on how the laws of physics work and how cars crash that that car skidded off the road and crashed into the ditch. But all of your arguments are based on the uniformitarianism assumption. It's not, again, what it's is all the assumption. Uniformitarian assumption. Assuming that it's always, it's always happened um, without any sort of What's uh, catastrophe. Well, like well, rocks forming, no. they're slowly, gradually forming over millions okay. or hundreds of thousands of years. That is not what uniformitarian geology says. Uniformitarian <sighs> geology... It absolutely is. is. No, it's just not. just don't like that. <laughs> what it says is that... I would like to talk to Eric. I feel like you've been taking up most of... Um, like, you've been talking for, like, most of the time. I'd like to hear more from the other two people here. All right. And so what I was wanting to say earlier, but, you know, but uh, you and Dapper got a little bit uh, busy, which is fine. You, you know, both, both of you are allowed, you know, to have your time to talk. And so the bottom line job of a scientist is to observe the physical world. And most um, most scientists do not think about God. And I mean, the truth, there are some yeah. scientists who are atheists who are trying to de- like who are trying to destroy God, but yet it's also not like that. The whole entire scientific community is trying to do that, and so um, one of the key character um, so one of the most important aspects of science is that it needs to be repeatable. And if it's not repeatable, 
I mean, if it doesn't have any be, if it doesn't have any be, blah, blah, blah. And if it doesn't have any mm -hmm. uh, repeatable uh, capabilities, well, then it's not science. You know, it kind of goes back to what I said about you're you know, the only evolutionist that's ever admitted this. I really thank you for this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean, yeah. you know, it's one of the things that I do what I do. I mean, th th there are some atheist scientists and I, i'm not saying that every single one of them are like this but you know yeah. but there are some and like who say that oh oh uh, oh evolution uh disproves god but it, it mm -hmm. doesn't mean at all i mean none of the data says that yeah. man if it man if it makes you feel any better i know that i may not convince you but you you also could even look into uh, something called process structuralism which is mm -hmm. which actually like was advocated by Simon Conway Morris, who you know, who was a Christian. Uh, he even debated with Richard Dawkins, and uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, yeah, and you know, kind of like what I said during my debate on Saturday. You know, scientists, the, the whole science community as a whole their whole job is not to take you away from god the bottom line is uh, the job of a scientist is to observe the physical world yeah i, I agree mm -hmm. yeah, i i agree I, I'm, I'm just glad you actually you're one of the few evolutionists that will ever admit like what, when something is actually scientific, because that's be repeatable, demonstrable, observable, you know what I mean. And so, thank you. But um, yeah, for sure. And and you know, after all that testing, after all that repeatable testing, <sighs> sorry. Okay. And after and after all that, none of that, and I repeat, none of that has ever shown like that. There is no God. Yeah, None absolutely. Not. Absolutely. And anybody who says that and anybody who says otherwise, um, you know, as respectful as I can be, you know, people are entitled to their opinions, but yeah. but having an opinion is different than a yeah. fact. Yeah. Yeah, I've always thought there were two different I always thought there were two different subjects myself. Belief in God and belief in I would say, I would say belief, but you know crazy like no God. versus no Crisis versus evolution debate and belief in uh, God are two different things, in my mm -hmm. opinion. One has to do that. One has to do with the other one. And um, and you know, I always wanted to emphasize on this. Uh, a year ago, when I went on this big, um, I made me of course Lamont and Dapper know about this. It was being because you know of the podcast that I've done with both of you. Um, a year ago, I was, I had like the biggest question of my life was the Bible say about dinosaurs? It's because when I was a kid, I was really into, you know, Jurassic Park. I had all the toys and everything. So who can say that that was the planting of the seed for me, you know, for me wanting to be interested in science and all that. And uh, when I became a Christian in 2014, because of, I don't want to get too personal, but because of a very dark event like that uh, haunts me to this very day. Um, I guess you could say that that just led me to the inevitable question, what was the Bible say about dinosaurs? And so honestly, throughout the whole entire investigation, I honestly wanted it, I, I honestly wanted, you know, it, I, I wanted it to honestly lead me um, to the conclusion, I, I thought that I should decide for myself. Um, and honestly, and uh, and my thought, I should decide truth for myself. And you know, mm -hmm. people can d decide it for th themselves. Like, say that there are d disagreements about uh, baptism in some religions. There are some where they say, um, like, like they shouldn't be baptized as a baby, while others don't. You know, and that, that that's fine you know they can decide that for themselves and um i mean honestly during the whole time it wasn't like that i was it wasn't like that i was like trying to prove evolution is 
were right or wrong. Um, I just honestly just wanted to look into it myself and see for myself, um, okay, is it true or not? And and, and obviously, you know, uh, since uh, you all know my stance on it now, um, I decided for myself, which I think is very, very important for people in their, their lives. Decide yeah, for yourself. Yeah. But at the same time, though, I also do think that be, being open-minded, I also think that being open-minded can definitely be a g good thing. Yeah. Like that, well, you know. Say that, for example, say if I'm at the gym and if I'm doing something wrong, you know, say if I'm not doing my squats right, if I'm, if I, like, say if I'm not in the right position, well, and then say if a trainer comes in and shows me, hey, you're doing this wrong and I just want to show you this. And, and of course, with being open-minded, you, you and then can learn from what you did was wrong. One of the ways how I see it is that failures always are biggest teachers in life. And I'm also not saying that, Cody, like that, you have to believe in evolution either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I personally, I think is once you, tr once you try, I, I'm always trying to learn new things. I, I think once you stop trying to learn things and you, and you, you can't really grow anymore, you, you, you always got to try to learn new things, even if not, not agree with it or not. Like, Keep on moving your expanding your mind yeah yeah i, I have a qu i have some just a question for eric just like about okay. like interpreting genesis specifically because how do you how do you go about getting the creation account to um kind of like describe evolution like i pointed out in the debate i mean they're backward in every detail i mean just like from what evolution says to what the clear text of Genesis says, they really are backwards. So, but how do you go about it? Like just interpreting? Well, there are many different ways how to interpret it. And I also know that people like Ken Hamill will say, oh, well, they're just trying to force millions of years into it. And, but, you know, but the ways of how that I personally look at it, kind of like we had the whole thing with Copernicus about the immovable, Earth, the pillars on the Earth. Um, it basically was just people just uh, trying to, you say, okay, maybe there's something that we're missing from this. I, I'm in. I actually would personally argue like that they're trying to understand Scripture better. I mean, it's because science has actually helped us uh, better understand some parts of the Bible before. And I also know that people like Ken Ham will say, oh well, you know, the uh, virgin birth. Uh, 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 yeah, you know. To be perfectly clear, no theistic evolutionists, no old earth creationists will, will ever, you know, and none of them like will ever will argue, you know, and, a, about that. Um, it, it's because, of mm -hmm. course, like, with us being a theist and, you know, with God being all powerful, God can, you know, God can intervene whenever he wants to. Because he's so powerful, I don't think that he has to necessarily all the time. And there's so many different interpretations like that. Honestly, in our lifetime, we may or may never even know. Now, Mama, now you could take one interpretation of it, but you don't have to. And, and so that was what that they learned from like Copernicus and uh, the earth being the center of the universe. And now just me personally, Mama now, like I said, I decided for myself. I personally think that biblical scholar, uh, John Walton actually makes a lot of very, very good points by the fact that we have to understand the Bible in its ancient context. We have to, we have to understand their whole culture. And, you know, from all the studies he has done, back then, the ancient people during that time, they weren't thinking about where matter comes from. And they weren't thinking about any of that. They weren't thinking about, you know, material creation or anything. Back then, they were more so interested in how things functioned. Um, and so, um, basically, John Walton's uh, uh, Cosmic Temple Moderation is... Uh, pretty much I missed the seven day uh, temple of 
it's a seven day temple of like God assigning function to everything. And I even brought up no sun till the fourth day. Well, just by this particular interpretation, um, it's just that that particular interpretation uh, pretty much indicates like the, on the fourth day, like was when God assigned a function to mm -hmm. the sun. And um, now and then, now and certainly, uh, of course, I'm not saying that you have to take this interpretation, but it's just that one of the reasons why that I, I guess, got convinced of it is because that he makes very, very good points about how we should read it in the ancient context. We, 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 we like shouldn't just rely on English translated versions of the Bible. And now, of course, I'm not saying never ever read a English translation of the Bible. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that don't strictly rely. Yeah. I'm just saying, just don't rely on that. It's because if you rely on a plain reading of the Bible, well, like I said on Saturday night, like because it mentions unicorns and uh, Psalms, you know, one of the most important aspects of interpreting the Bible, study the context. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, when you look, look, look into the context, how it mentions unicorns in Psalms, it's actually talking about a rhino. And so, and... Uh, Something and like a rhino, rhino yeah. yeah. Um, I know it was a particular rhino. I forgot its name off the top of my head, but... Uh, has that one but the, <laughs> right but, but it's just but it's just like that the bottom line is it's talking about a rhino it isn't rhinoceros talking about what rhinoceros 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 rhinoceros. Rhinoceros. yeah that's right what yeah and so that, that you can say that in a way the unicorns do exist kind of yeah it's uh yeah it's just that i know that there's a lot of disagreement with age of the earth uh, within christianity and you know and you know, and people are allowed to have their interpretations, but it's just that, you know, mom, in order for you to be saved, you don't have to go with this particular inter interpretation. And I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of like with all the differences within Catholicism and Lutheranism and et cetera, you know, you, you know, all of them may have their differences uh, about some things, but the bottom line is we all believe in the same God. Yeah. Um, so kind of interesting, I guess, though, because like in Genesis, um, it's uh, it doesn't really say God. It says Elohim, um, which actually is plural, you know, would you be against someone interpreting that it was actually multiple gods that created the heavens and the earth? Because, well, you know, well, I mean, I mean, the bottom line is. Uh, um, it's not really any of my business, like what other people's b beliefs are. Uh, I would actually say it's probably not reasonable to interpret that as supporting. Well, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And my reason there is that um, if I am remembering correctly, and it's been a while since I pulled up my Hebrew Old Testament, if I remember correctly, the verb forms used when Elohim is the subject are still singular. So while Elohim is yeah. morphologically plural, it does not seem to be grammatically plural from the standpoint of the text. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've heard two. I've heard two different theories, uh, hypotheses, or theories about that. One, one of them, like in like like in the like Genesis account one or two, I forget what it is, but like when he said, "Let us go down and create men in our image." One of them, he, God's talking to the one person, God's talking to the angels, telling them to do this, and then one uh, other theory is God's talking to Himself in the Trinity version. Yeah, that's the two main interpretations. The um, in Judaism, they really hold to the angel, like talking about the host of heaven, like let us, like me and the angels. And then the, the more the Christian view is, it was well, just Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us go down. And then um, we see um, he stops referring to himself as us once the Holy Spirit is with Abraham, which is pretty good evidence, I would say. But this is only I've never heard anyone say that. I'm just saying I notice. Like once, a, once God is with Abraham, he stops referring to himself as us, and so maybe it's because the Holy Spirit is with Abraham, and um, now they're kind of separate, so to speak. I mean, not separate, but you know what I mean. So now it's we would stop saying us because us isn't really all together. <laughs> I've never heard anyone actually give a a reason for why he stops referring to himself as us. I've just heard for why he refers to himself plural. You know, 
I think Trinity is the best answer, but um, yeah. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I think I think the hermeneutics are pretty clear, and um, I mean, I saw this person says, that's easy, the Bible isn't meant to be taken literally, but like just that, I've heard that probably like 24 million times, and I agree the whole Bible isn't meant to be taken literally. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah like, like, do you, do you, like, like, that reminds me, we talked about this earlier, off, before something started, but like the... Like, do you think the Bible says the Earth is flat? And you think the Earth, you think the Earth is flat? Um, so no, I don't think the Earth is flat, and I think it's pretty obvious that um, you know, the That's Bible's not. not teaching a flat Earth at all. But especially in Job, when it talks about the horizon setting the separating the the darkness from the light, which would only work on a sphere. But yeah, I heard. I've heard. Oh, sorry. Well, Eric. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, Cody, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, didn't you ask me, uh, like, uh, um, and didn't uh, didn't you or somebody in the chat on Saturday um, ask uh, me, like, wh wh what I think that the Bible says about the age of the Earth in general? I don't remember. Sorry. Um, all right. Well, you know, I just say that I just say that my memory is correct. Um, yeah. Well, let's just say theoretically um you probably might remember in my opening statement with my debate with ken hovind uh after that whole year of after the whole year of research about dinosaurs and the bible you know just being honest um it just led me to the conclusion like that the bible is more concerned like with the more am uh it's more concerned like with like the more important as uh, aspects of Christianity it is a fact that you know is to tell you essentially like uh, who God is, and then it's to set up the relationship between. Humans yeah, and I God. remember. You, or I think I remember on age of your video with Merrick Kaiser, you were talking about the Bible is more for getting people saved. Yes. Well, I mean, I think I think that's how I think we think it's more important to get people saved. I mean, Bible itself. I think on every topic, it's equally important but like for salvation which is most important to humans that's where we think it's definitely most important and that's what most of the new testament is about you know um but if you think i think on topics of history i think it's perfect it doesn't get anything wrong i think on cosmology it never gets anything wrong um i know a lot of people say well, what's like it talks about has flat earth passages but then they always point to like psalms and then right after which is poetry and then right after poetry where it talks about pillars of the earth and it talks about god having wings it's like well no this is poetry it's 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 you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to take it literally this person says so so we just take the convenient parts literally or well no what i said was i don't take the whole bible literally because if i did I, that would i would need to take an english class again so i take the literal parts literally and i take the poetic parts as poetry and i take the prophetic parts as prophecy and I take the um, just like the instruction parts, like you know, like proverbs, like wisdom, which is also poetry. But like stoning you know, somebody for working Saturday, you don't take that literally either, probably. No, I I do take the Old Testament law literally. But when you study Christian theology, as Jesus said, all those laws were fulfilled through Him, and He gave us two commandments afterward. Now we only live by two laws: love God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. So we don't we don't actually do those Old Testament laws, but before the Messiah came and fulfilled those laws, then we would have done those, but those aren't for us today. So I do take them literally as everyone did, but I don't actually do them because they're not for us. And I was want to chime in like about what you said about like the cosmology in the Bible, but yeah. what we have to understand is like that the ancient people's cosmology like has a heck of a lot different I like than our cosmology now. Mama's oh yeah. I mean, so the thing about science, um, you know, a key characteristic about science is like that it's willingness to change when new evidence arrives. I, I, I'm a so and then what might have been accepted as the scientific consensus back then is of course different now men it also will be different in the future you know there are some things that we accept now that may not be true but at the same time though you know 
just because I say that, it also has an automatic mean that <coughs> the stuff we accept now is not true. Like, of course, you know, gravity has been something that's been accepted for mm -hmm. the longest time, and it's pretty much 99.9% .9 impossible that gravity is ever going to be dis disproven. Um, and so, yeah. so it kind of goes back to what I said, you know, you, you have to hook into it the way how they viewed it. I don't actually think so when it comes to biblical cosmology. So I, I, I agree that I think the authors of the Bible, yeah. like Job, probably thought we lived on a flat disc, even though, um, you know, a flat disc with a dome, you know, that cosmology. But even though I was actually watching an interesting um, episode of like a Christian apologist talking about like the firmament and stuff. And he was actually saying how there's actually a little evidence that the um, ancient Babylonians and people in the Mediterranean area actually believe in a flat earth. But even if they did, I'll gladly accept it. Like I, I'm perfectly fine if the psalmists believe that earth is flat. Here's here's what here's where I, I differ with a lot of apologists. I don't think what the Bible itself is describing is a flat earth dome cosmology i think it's describing accurate and so far it's been accurate but i think the authors themselves probably thought they were writing down under the inspiration of the holy spirit probably thought they were writing down like flat earth cosmology but it's obvious that it couldn't be flat earth it, it, it would contradict itself but you know so i don't like there's mike what's his name um michael heiser is that his name yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, michael he's, heiser. He, yeah he thinks that the Bible really did write down just erroneous cosmology, even though not in Job, that's for sure. But um, so he says, just accept the erroneous cosmo cosmology, but then the rest of the Bible isn't erroneous. Well, if that's true, then like the Bible is wrong just just within um day two of creation. <laughs> so I mean, when it talks about the firmament, right? So I mean, no, I definitely don't. I don't think that at all. I think it's entirely accurate. Um, even if it goes against what what modern scientific community says i think that i mean like all the science in seven in the 1700s by the 1800s it was all com like 90 percent of it wasn't even except it was disproven i mean cosmologies come and cosmologies go it's not like you just accept one thing oh the bible's wrong because the bible is really good at correcting people on on the in science and history and theology you know what i mean, I mean you're christians you already know that but um but i mean that's why in my debate, I'm always saying, make the Bible the standard. And for someone that doesn't do that, it's going to sound like circularity about, you know, make the Bible the standard because science comes, science goes, but um, not the Bible. I actually have a little question about that. If, sure. if it turns out that you're wrong about your interpretation of the Bible, and mm -hmm. it's an interpretation that's cons like, I, I would say that in many cases, there are interpretations of the Bible where there's more than one uh, interpretation that conflict with each other, but that don't necessarily conflict with the text. If you were in a situation like that and your standard weren't judging it based on reality, then how would you ever know if you were wrong about the Bible in a situation where more than one interpretation could be viable? Man, I just want to chime in on that. It kind of goes what I said during my opening with Ken Hovind a little bit. You know, I, I was saying that you know, like that it's a false dichotomy about the age of the earth. And it's kind of like when people in the 1980s, I forget their names, but yet, you know, it has happened. At, and if you're curious, who can do the research yourself? People said that, I believe 1984, saying, that, oh, well, Jesus does not return in 1984. Well, then Christianity is not true. But, you know, but the thing is, what I'm a Christianity... It depends on the absolute most. I mean, I'm sure that Cody will, will agree whether or not if Jesus really did rise from the dead. Christianity holds by that we to be the string. If yeah. Jesus did not rise from the dead, then yeah, that's definitely the main, definitely the main thing. Yeah, Honestly, I guess I, I would say it's the only thing. No matter what else is true, if there's a guy named Jesus who died in Jerusalem on a cross and that on Friday and then Sunday, he wasn't dead anymore. That's it. Christianity is at its fundamental point. True. If it's not, then no matter how else, no matter how true anything else in the Bible might be, then it's Christianity at its core. Isn't true. Yeah. I mean, to me, inerrancy of scripture is also a big deal, you know, like, um, how Jesus, um, 
said that his law would never, his law meaning the scriptures, would never, never go away, would never be lost. And so to me, if there, if we did, and I study textual criticism, and I believe in inerrancy of scripture, and I know that there have been things added by scribes, and we know what they are, but um, like we, if we were to lose and know we've lost scripture, I would say Christianity probably isn't true, but that's probably not enough for some people. I'm actually thinking about trying a... Uh... I'm planning a video involving textual criticism because it's yep. uh, it's a very interesting field about doing things like uh, manuscript families and tracing scribal errors through copyists and mm -hmm. things like that. I love it. So actually, if you have any particularly good books or anything you'd recommend, I would love to get recommendations Just, on that. I have a person to recommend. I have oh? a person with that wrote a hundred books. He's um massive um, in textual criticism. He's translated bibles he, he's amazing so his name's um it's dr james white i'm if, familiar with him okay I have he lives, he lives before, pretty close to me oh yeah really yeah i live very close oh, to dr. Just yeah, interview hey, him <laughs> oh i i have thought about it um because the the textual criticism angle is a very interesting one and um but one of the interesting things is the way that we reconstruct um family trees for Bible manuscripts mm -hmm. is the same technique that's used to reconstruct genetic family trees for different organisms because they both involve copying errors being carried forward. Yeah, well, the um, tracing Bible manuscript families and all these things, it's a lot more. It's really, really, like, unique. It's its own total study. Um, it's not oh, like it it's... Is. Yeah, it's not like it's just parallel with... Um, it, it's actually very strongly parallel, though, because in both cases you look at where you can see evidence of in certain groups or areas we have yeah. changes I, I'd probably which agree are inherited with that. by daughter or child lineages if we don't want to sex it. It's actually it's a pretty, that's a pretty good example. Of, yeah. I never thought about it like that. It also happens with... We also do a similar thing with language families. Like the reason yeah. that we know that uh, English and Hindi and Pashtun and Latin and Greek and French and German are all Indo-European languages is because we can <laughs> sound, yeah. Yeah. sound and lexical changes through time in different locations. Just even without having uh, written examples of older languages, we can still do it just with the modern languages because we can trace back those changes. And so yep. we can reconstruct the most likely form of Proto-Indo-European uh, words in a similar way that we can use textual criticism to trace back the likely uh, original form for various texts. And of course, just like with biblical crit criticism or textual criticism, sorry, uh, with linguistics uh, and with doing the same thing with genetics, there's always going to be some cases where it's like, it could go either way on the, the initial reading of whatever this is. Yeah. There's so a I, lot of stuff like that in textual criticism. Yeah, and I think that the, the thread that connects all three of those things is um, oh. it's genetic descent. And by genetic, I don't mean in the sense of DNA. I mean in the sense of like all of these things are growing by being reproduced in an organic fashion. Like uh, languages grow and change organically as populations of speakers move around and slowly change the way they speak and split into mm -hmm. separate groups of speakers and they start changing differently in different places. And the same thing is true for uh, texts. You know, if you look at the Bible, these yep. scribal additions or errors or deletions or whatever start to accumulate as the Bible is copied and certain copies are based on other copies and a different copy is based on a different copy. And so that's yeah. an organic change. And the it, same it's, thing actually, it's like, like yeah, like, um, cause the, the manuscripts, they're all, they all go their own separate ways and they become different things. So the text, the criticism involves what did the original writer write, you know? So right. you're, and so it's like looking at all those textual variances that, that right. have been spread out through all the continents and you're seeing, it's like, it's really hard, <laughs> but and, it's uh, cool. And uh, that was why that on Saturday, I I, I thought that I should uh, present uh, uh, this article in my opening about interpreting uh, Genesis. Um, I mean, if you, um, hey, 
of you, 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 wanna, you, can, you want you can screen share that if you if it's on your computer or, or just you, let's just have a paper of it uh yeah um it's i don't know how well you, you guys can uh, see it yeah i yeah and so um i can't really make that out but maybe if i were on my bigger screen i don't know um um if you want dapper um i actually can send you a link to the paper itself like on twitter and i can even do the same thing for the rest of I you mean, I'd, be, I'd be interested in it yeah uh, or we get, we get, we get the, if we get in the chat and i can put we get in the chat i can put in the description yeah mm -hmm. and so pretty oh, much yeah. what the paper talks about it is pretty much about how we need to be cautious with interpreting genesis we have to understand uh, how, how, like that it was not written in modern day english and if we misread it it actually can my mom it actually can lead to denial of you know of science and and, and concluding evolution and, and i know that cody you know will d disagree on that and that's fine but it's just well, but speaking it's just, of james white he he thinks he speaks hebrew and greek and german he thinks that the the hebrew and genesis is literal it's supposed to be taken six 24-hour days fundamentally because that's what the hebrew suggests with with yom and just the overall writing style of whoever wrote it Right, but um, I don't know that you'll disagree, but um, the paper word yom can actually mean a lot of different things. Yeah. You know that, Mom, and even though that you could interpret it as a 24-hour day, and, you know, and, I, and I'm not saying like that you shouldn't because I say so. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying like that also, it also could mean always, it could mean a go, it, it could mean a lot of things and now at the same time though i'm also not saying oh well you know the bible speaks of the earth being old it's because you know just by me personally by the, the decision that i made i don't think yeah. that the bible speaks of how old the earth is at all and i'm not trying to be redundant but it's just that you know it's just not what the bible is concerned about yeah it's not but um with yom itself like, I, I agree, it can be used in many ways, just like yes. day in English can be uh -huh. used in many ways in, in one sentence, but yes. it's the context that defines what it means. And mm -hmm. even even in, I mean, in Genesis itself, defies that day is light, and then the darkness is night, meaning an ordinary day. And it goes off to say there was evening and there was morning, marking the day, and then with a numerical day, and saying first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, and in Exodus twenty eleven, God says, "Because I made the I made the sea and everything in the world in six days, therefore you're going to work in six days, and you're also going to rest on the seventh day." So I mean, it's the context that easily defines Yom, and um, it, it's it's really not like that hard to figure out. But the reason that there's motivation to change or reinterpret that that word Yom is because people don't like a literal. His, a Genesis, but the truth is the Hebrew from all I've done, I don't study, I mean, I don't speak Hebrew, but I've studied specifically with the creation and it really does seem to suggest, I know there's obvious, obvious presupposition, but it really suggests six 24 hour days just based entirely on context. But then every time it's referenced in the Bible, it also means six days. There's no way you get errors. I would never say um, six days, meaning six years, unless it was like prophecy, but um, like, I, I know they always say, well, we don't know how, I mean, no one struggles with day and the rest of the Bible. Jonah was in the whale for three days. Why does no one struggle with that time period? Joshua, seven days as well, he dropped, marched around Jericho. No one struggles with it because there's no motivation to get it to say something else that they would prefer it to say. But evolution and old earth and, and local flood believers, they want the creation to not be so, something so quick and miraculous and rapid, but they'd prefer it to be um, they would prefer it to be something very naturalistic or just long ages, time periods. But I've list, Hebrew scholars are so divided on that topic that there's no way to reference scholars. I mean, for every every scholar that says it's literal days, there's another scholar that says it's it can mean long periods of time. But again, it's that context in in Hebrew and in the Greek translation of the Old Testament and in the English in every language, it's very clearly meaning six 24 hour days. Um, and with me going with the Cosmic Temple inauguration, I actually would agree 
like that, that it was six like that, that it was six literal 24 hour days but at the same time though i would just say that those were days and like when god decided like to assign function but uh, mm -hmm. but you also have to understand and like that you know kind of like what i said you don't i mean you don't have to go with that interpretation and um, and i mean you i mean you certainly can but and you also have to understand and hype that these biblical scholars actually are studying the they actually are studying the uh um they actually are studying the context of it and uh oh yeah oh yeah and i how that we're going off topic a little bit i'm sorry but, but, but there was this question i was wanting to ask you me yeah okay so you mentioned during the debate and you didn't clarify it and i was wanting to ask but you know but I got caught up with other things. So you said that you were convinced by some of the dinosaur carvings. Uh, which ones? Some of them. Uh, I guess I would have to share my screen then. Like, again, I'm not convinced um, by... Would one of them, Mom and would one of them be like the alleged uh, sauropod on the um, uh, rock wall? I gotta be honest with you, I can't really... I think that I know what you're like talking about, though. Yeah. So what? Um, that looks like a blue circle, not a dinosaur. Yeah, well, we can't really uh, see the. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I can't. I can't really see the thing, but I'm not uh, sure, uh, honestly. Maybe this one will be. That's uh, th I've seen that one. Yeah, I'm. I, I think it's under, convincing. But when you look at the context, um, it all that it actually is is just a bunch of. Well, I mean, I have. Well, that's the the, the I, picture I on the paper. Honest. I mean, I I have the actual thing here, the actual picture, the enhanced like. What's that showing. called? Um, this uh. Like, what if I wanted to find an image? What would I search? I'm pretty sure it's found in Utah, I believe. Um, I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but uh, I'm pretty sure it shouldn't be too hard. I mean, if it's from Utah, I think it's probably just a picture of a snake trying to eat some fries with fry sauce. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's, but like I'm at, I'm looking at the actual picture of the wall, and okay, that what was on the paper is not it's not there. So, so it's just, no, it, and it's just the thing is, you know, on the original wall, you actually can vaguely see it. Um, and um, and uh, so and then like some uh, stuff under the dinosaur, but like it's very clear that there's a difference between what was on the paper and what's actually on the wall, like. It's very obvious that this is something that looks. If it's not a dinosaur, it looks at least just like one. Long tail, four legs under, long neck, little head. But you also have to understand that a core in a sauropod anatomy, uh, sauropod's tails actually did not drag like that. Um, sauropod's tails actually like. Yeah, I know. They sway like a cedar. <laughs> Sorry. Which I point out well, to you. Well, actually, no, they, they, they were much too stiff to sway like a cedar. Yeah, I know. Well, that's why like cedars are stiff. Actually, no. You, uh, it's not Middle the branches. Eastern, Middle Eastern cedars are actually rather wispy and go back and forth a lot. American cedars are quite stiff, but they're not the same species. And it's very so, unlikely yeah, the tail is referring to the American cedar. Yes, the tail um, of the behemoth, it, it's, it's like there's different ways to translate, but all of it simply just says sways or it erects or it stiffens like a cedar and then someone in the chat i didn't get to respond they said like in the in the debate they said that's just they were using the king james english translation without going to anything else and they were like see it's talking about testicles and stuff it's like yes that was the king james translator's interpretation let's look at the hebrew and of course the hebrew doesn't even i've looked at the masoretic text the septuagint sentinel apologetics is trying to convince me this on facebook i'm like dude i'm looking at all the hebrew it's not there, Ugh. but um, but again, I'm not necessarily trying to argue that the behemoth is a specifically sauropod, but I think it's obviously some sort of dinosaur. So if it's not a sauropod, um, since you said it obviously has to be a dinosaur, so if not mm -hmm. a sauropod, what is it then? And also, like I pointed out, did it, Mom, it says that it has a nose that pierces through snares. I don't know of any dinosaur that has a nose that pierces through snares at all yeah i mean well I, I i just have a better question step back for a second what animal is this then 
Uh, You're an evolutionist. That a question for me? Yeah. Well, um, because of the nose that pierces through snares, I, you know, just I just personally think that that's you know I just personally think it's an elephant and um, and um, you, you know it also talks about how it has strong bones or well elephants have strong bones too and and they kind of have to is because of the fact that um they weigh so much um and then when they run you know and if they didn't have mama they didn't have strong bones but when they run you, you know of course their bones would break and um many even like i said about the uh tree being mentioned um it's not describing what, what the tail looks like it's just describing the movement and the cedar tree that existed during the cedar tree that exists during job's day is the Lebanese cedar tree and the Lebanese cedar tree looks just like a tail of an elephant um and mm -hmm. also moves like one they're also right and, and it moves high like an elephant's tail and there also are some people who say that behemoth is a rhino or, or a hippopotamus <laughs> i mean i can i guess i can get where they're coming from but you know but just me personally i, I know personally, where they're coming from they're coming from Africa. it can only be some they're coming from it can only be something modern or something that coexisted with man because they don't like when it says they don't like the idea of it being something that is like a dinosaur okay. but i mean your description of okay there, there's the something you said a whole bunch of times and it's that so, someone doesn't like this so they're interpreting it in a way that is yep so hang on hang on with this but the I, know, thing I know is, but hang on you can't Eric? impute yeah, whether what? or not these people like these things i would much rather have sore have behemoth be a sauropod right no i'm saying i'm not saying you literally like don't like it i'm not saying you literally don't prefer it i'm what i mean by that is just in general you you don't you you can't have it that way. You need it to be something else. So the motivation is to change it. Her, I don't need it to be anything. Out. I'm just saying that there no, is. You would no... not have. You listen, listen. You would not ever accept that being a dinosaur in Job's day because it contradicts your theory. No, you would not. I that... absolutely would. No, because you one, wouldn't. A sauropod, a late surviving sauropod, doesn't contradict anything about anything. It's just unlikely. And second, no, this, in, yeah, it's order, to, in order to come up with an unusual interpretation, you have to have good evidence. And the fact is that the animal described isn't clearly a sauropod. And we don't know that there were sauropods in the area at the time. Whether or not the story of Genesis flood Could it be any no. dinosaur? It could, it could but at the same but time, no. Any dinosaur is the least likely explanation. Well, it's not the least likely explanation because if the young Earth interpretation is correct, well, then that would, it would why would God be talking about an elephant when he's talking about the chief of the way? Or like the description you describe for an elephant doesn't fit at all; it only fits for some things. But another time, it doesn't really work. Like, okay, let's assume young Earth creationism is true. Dinosaurs got off the ark. We don't know how long go. they lasted. We don't know exactly when Job was written, nor do we know whether or not there were dinosaurs there. If God wants to impress Job with a big animal, he's not going to use an animal that Job hasn't heard of. We don't know. How do you know Job dinosaurs. hasn't heard of dinosaurs? That's we, that's all. You I'm just based a case. Do. Yes, you, you literally just no, said, I Job am, probably doesn't know. Therefore, why would God say, no, I said Job, Job, Lucas, I said doesn't God know. Use a and I have a better, I have a better question. Why would, why would God use, use an no, animal? You know what? That's I'm really going to finish not... my point and then you can ask your question. Since we don't know if there were dinosaurs around at the time and place that Job was written, but we have really oh God, good reasons uh, to say that we don't know, do know that there were elephants and hippos and rhinos at least nearby. We can say it's very likely that Job knew what an elephant was and what a hippopotamus mm -hmm. was and what a rhino was. It's less likely he knew what a sauropod was because we have no evidence of there being sauropods in historical times in the Middle East. Well, listen, listen. Okay. Now you can ask your question. I don't remember what my question was specifically. Sorry. I guess it would be for Eric. So, um... Okay. Um, the, there's a lot of, Job 40 really describes this creature in detail. So first off, do you, so do you think this was a, like actual animal? Was it mythical? So, um, I know that there is some debate whether or not if Job, the, the, the whole thing about Job was, uh, like if it was just, the whole thing is just supposed to be a parable or if it's something that really happened, just my own personal opinion. I do think that it, I, I personally do think it did happen, but I just kind of think it's just described in just a metaphorical way, you know, like 
think you know say how that I'm going to tell you the events about when I woke up this morning. I'll say that, oh, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And uh, I'm so, like I said, with me loving dinosaurs, I would love Behemoth to be a dinosaur. Yeah, man, it kind of goes back to what I said. It's, the bottom line is scientists are, are not trying to, you know, they're, they're not trying to take it away from God. Um, you know, it's uh, not like that scientists say, oh, well, we have to have dinosaurs living millions of years before man. It's because, you know, we wanted to disprove the Bible. That's not it at all. The bottom line of a scientist is let the evidence bring you to your conclusion. And regardless what your presupposition is, you have to let the evidence bring you to your conclusion. And like I said, I would love, I, I would love Behemoth to be a dinosaur. Men out of all people, I would love it to be a dinosaur. But just honestly, after looking at the context and, and just examining like the creatures that lived you know, like in Job's day, when it mentions the chief of God, I understand that some young earth creationists will say, well, it has to be a sauropod. But we also have to understand that in that area, the, the um, I forget the elephant's name, but um, in that area, there actually is a species of elephant like that was the largest in that spot. And so that's one of the reasons why that I think it's an elephant. And another reason, it also says that he lieth under the shady tree or some sort of tree i forget the and i'm off the top of my head okay so if you were to say that it's argentinosaurus which is the, the, the largest sauropod ever found i mean no joke a hike just a vertebrae of an argentinosaurus alone is about half the size of my bed um, so to think that if an Argentinosaurus were even to lie down underneath the, the shady tree or, or whatever, it just wouldn't work. It's because of just how enormously huge it was. But yet you wouldn't have that problem with an elephant, rhino, or a hippopotamus, or, or et cetera. And, uh, and like I said, a sauropod dinosaur or any dinosaur does not have a nose that pierces it through snares. And, uh, and, and, you know, and honestly, does it bum me out that, uh, behemoth is not, not a dinosaur? Yeah. But, you know, just honestly, after hooking the evidence of seeing when in the fossil record, when sauropods went extinct, we're not saying that, oh, well, it's flat. And, and, oh, well, we're saying it's possible. It's because we want it to be that way. That's not the job of, of a scientist. I mean, even with the coelacanth, people thought for the longest time like that the coelacanth like was done for. And hi, Simba. <laughs> and oh yeah, so, so I was to talk about the coelacanth. Um, sorry, it's just that my dog here kind of. <laughs> you want to be uh, a guest star? But yeah, so um. God darn you, Simba. And that's how we got 100 new viewers. The dog came on camera. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Simba, say hi. to everyone. And so, uh, moment. So, uh, evolution does not say, oh, hell, a species has to go, ex has to go extinct by this certain time frame. I also know that there are young earth creationists who actually use the coelacanth as an argument against evolution, saying, oh, well, it hasn't changed at all. Which it has. Yes, and it has actually. Um, there actually has been coelacanths found in the Paleocene and Miocene. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dapper. Um, I don't I'm know sure if any Miocene coelacanths, but I know. I'm pretty sure there was a Paleocene or a Pylocene. So uh, the way I remember the fossil record for coelacanths, and I, again, my wheelhouse is more in Mesozoic or near the Dirons, so coelacanths are a bit outside of that area. So right. Just a little bit. But um, from what I remember, uh, the last coelacanth fossils known were in the Cretaceous, and they do not occur mm -hmm. above the KPG or the KT, or whatever we want to call it now, boundary. Uh, but that no fossil of coelacanth is in the same family as the modern coelacanths. Right, and... Um, 
the current mm -hmm. explanation is that the coelacanths that we have were all shallow water organisms, which preserve fairly readily, whereas deep water organisms tend not to preserve very well. And even when they do, because oceanic crust tends to be uh, subsumed under the mantle so frequently, we tend not to get very old fossils from uh, deep water marine sediments because they're just rare in general, which is why deep water animals are the ones that are most likely to end up being Lazarus taxa in the modern day. Hey, um, hey we're fast. Cody, somebody has a question for you. Yeah, I wanted to answer um, about the gap theory. So gap theory is basically that there, there's a, there's a, millions or hundreds of thousands of years between the first and second verse of Genesis. And so then that's, that was, um, the idea came up in the 1800s because Christians were kind of concerned about what to do with all the, the scientists that are saying the earth is billions or well, millions of years old. So they are like, oh, well, let's just take the text and put those years between the first two verses of the Bible. And so, and it, the problem is, um, it's, it's a sneaky theory. It's a sneaky theory. The problem is there's not really enough biblical evidence to support it at all. I think all it is is really just uh, what Christians were doing. They were just really compromising the text to fit what they thought was right, and it was they didn't need to do that. So just another theory. It's no different than framework hypothe hypothesis or day age or progressive creationism or theistic evolutionism. In my opinion: it, the Bible it was written truthfully. It was preserved preserved without any errors um in the hebrew there's no problems with it um in general i mean <laughs> but um so we don't need to put year you know put we don't need to put millions of years between verses that aren't there it's kind of ridiculous and the other problem is well with that theory you have death before sin um you have all these major theological problems which is another reason i don't really buy it i i, I will admit to this guy um the gap theory is one of the is one of the best old earth reinterpretations I've heard, but it's it's not enough. There's just it's one of the best interpretations I've heard, but there's not enough biblical evidence to support it. So I just don't buy it. I just think it's totally stretching the text to say something. It's not in any way saying. I think it's pretty obvious what the text is actually saying. But yeah. And so uh, I was wanting to get back to the coelacanth. I know that we're jumping back and forth. And so people need to understand like, that fish fossilize a lot differently than dinosaurs do. Uh, it's, a lot, um, it's a lot easier um, for dinosaurs to fossilize. It's because of their bones are a lot harder. Um, the, the, the harder the bone is, the easier it is to fossilize. And so then... That's why that there are some spots in the fossil record where you don't uh, see some particular, um, where you don't see some particular uh, organisms like the coelacanth. Yeah. But then it was eventually found in some of the Cenozoic layers, like that. There were some coelacanths found. Um, I can see that there were changes, but but they were just slow changes. Coelacanths are known essentially as the slow pokes of evolution. Uh, sorry, real, real fast. Can you, two questions. One, one for one for you, and one for Co 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 for Cody. Or hey, Cody, me. We're both with you. For a second, Co Cody. If you want to pay attention to the chat, you can answer questions in chat without actually having to answer it. If somebody's talking, you can answer questions in chat if you want to in the chat, mm -hmm. chat, live chat. If you pay attention to that, people asking you questions. And two, uh, I forget. Our seal can't. Seal uh, can't is is that the species or the uh, family? And Corinthians is like the, I forget which is which. Uh, um, I, I can help with that. If, if I'm pretty not. sure that it's a. I'm pretty sure that it's a family. I'm I, I'm pretty certain that there, you know there's not just one seal can't and it's kind of like how you know like, like that there's not just one uh, uh, like any organism you, you know it branches out. Um. So, um, you know, like what, like what Dapper said. I think that he can. Yeah. So, see, like, so first we got to remember that words like family, order, class are all sort of that they don't mean a whole lot. Uh, genus and species kind of mean something, but uh, coelacanths are, if we include the fossil examples, they're all part of the uh, coelacanthiform order, and there have been a number of families. The only uh, family that is extant is uh, Latimeridae, 
And, but there were numerous uh, extinct families from the fossil record. And as far as I know, I don't know of any extensive fossil record for Latimerids. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, coelacanths, in, if, we, if you were to go with crown coelacanths based on extant coelacanths, then only one family exists. But I would prefer to go with a more uh, character-based definition, uh, just because the, uh, the taxonomy for coelacanths internally isn't super well uh, figured out, in part because of a spotty fossil record. So. Um, I was want to ask uh, Cody something. Ken. Um. So, um. So, um. Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't you say that in your uh, podcast about the flood? Why I like that your family is also young Earth creationists. My podcast about the flood. Uh yeah. Um. It was the one that you did with Merrick and uh, one other guy. Oh yeah. The just that little discussion we had. But yeah, yeah. like if Noah's flow is global or local. Mm -hmm. Um so my family is not young or creationist. Or that well, most of my family's not even Christian or anything. My dad's older, so my mom doesn't have a position. My mm -hmm. my sister recently yesterday she just called me and uh she was she called me and she was really mad at me. She was like yelling at me for thirty minutes over the phone for being Christian and interpreting Genesis, you know, for literally and so, yeah. And so I oh, and and she hung up on me. What? Um, uh, sorry for barging, uh, but um, I know it's not my business, but I am kind of curious. Um, so and is so and is like she an atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, or what? She told me she basically. I think she's agnostic. Mm -hmm. She's just mad at me for for saying that. I am trying. She's mad at me basically for, like, that I'm trying to help people interpret Genesis in the way that I think is the right interpretation. That's what all of you. Yeah. Right, but um, but like I said during the d d debate, um, um, Mama, now I'm not saying the hunger creationism is doing this as a whole. You know, I don't have a problem with, with people being a hunger creationist. When I talked to Mary Schweitzer about this on the phone, um, she has told me like that. She had a bunch of her students who are d d devout Christians who would come and ball their eyes out to her thinking like, that they have to give up their faith because of all the overwhelming evidence that they see in evolution and in old earth, feeling like that they have to give up their faith. Um, and so... And, you know, and there have been um, in uh, the majority of atheists actually were once Christians like Richard Dawkins, Hugo and Jake uh, Heath. I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name. Heath Heith or something like that. Vice, um, Vice Rhino, Godless Engineer. Right, Godless oh, you engineer. mean the, the, the person who spells his name H-I-I-T-H? Yeah, 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 yeah. Him. I heard him try to pronounce that name in one of his recent videos. He can't do it either. So don't feel bad. Yeah, and so I'm assuming that he did that on purpose as like a gimmick or something. Maybe I don't know. I think it's supposed to be from some other language that he doesn't actually speak, but he likes the word. Because I remember, right. I think if I remember correctly, he had old channel art with something in like Sumerian or something. So I think that's the thing. Some, which I've noticed now in pop pop culture, Sumerian is now the language that apparently. Your fictional demons speak is that's the now now the new hotness which annoys me because why why would demons speak sumerian and so like i was saying um one of the main reasons why that these christians became an atheist is because that you know i like that they felt like that oh well i had to choose one or the other and so because of the overwhelming evidence they just kind of felt like that well i'm gonna have to well, I'm going to have to reject my faith now, leave it behind. And one of the reasons why that I do what, what I do, and I'm not saying that, oh, well, people have to be theistic evolution because I say so. Myths just that I, I'm just trying to say that, you know, if a fellow brother or sister of mine in Christ feels like that they have to give up their faith, now, and if someone's happy with being a hunger creationist, fine. I know, and if they're happy, 
I don't, I don't want to come, you know, overstep my boundaries or anything. I've even had Christian parents come up to me, tell me that they're horrified of taking their kids to the Museum of the Rockies, knowing that I go out on dinosaur digs, feeling hype that I am the one who they should talk to, saying that, oh, well, I'm, oh, well, I'm afraid that if I take my kids there, it's going to take them away from God. And so I don't want to overstep my boundaries. I don't want to be too dogmatic about it. I'll just say, hey, here are your options. And um, and the majority of old earth and theistic evolutionists were, they actually were once young earth creationists. And one of the reasons why that they came to those positions is because at one point they thought that they had to choose one or the other. Yeah. I think I made a video about this, top, top, same topic, a, a, a few few years ago. But there's diff, there there were different layers to this. There's there's young Earth creationists, old Earth creationists, theistic evolutionists. Then there's like the deist evolutionists, and then there's just plain out atheists. Mm-hmm. Um, Remember what I said um, in the debate. In the debate, I said, I have like. There- I said you can be a Christian and believe right. in evolution. But the right. problem is you're going to be completely inconsistent because you're you're accepting Jesus. You're a Christian. Well, that's great. And that's going to lead to eternal salvation. But the problem is, the main problem is you're accept you're 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 not accepting the logical foundation for why you accepted Jesus in the first place. You know what I'm saying? Theology is inconsistent if you're going to add all these interpretations to Genesis. It just it's more than just well. How? What does the text say? Well, it comes down to what's it do to theology? What's it do to the rest of the Bible? And it messes it up if it's not fundamentally interpreted, interpreted, and interpreted. I mean, to say. But um, uh. But like, I'm I'm not saying you can't be a Christian and right. believe in. You know, I I think that'd be ridiculous to tell someone you can't be a Christian if you believe in evolution or whatever. But um, like Billy Graham, what he believed in theistic evolution. You can believe in evolution and. Right. Well, some Christian, people but... don't think that, like some people like like Kent Hovind and Ken Ham don't think that literally say you can't be a Christian. They never said that. They never said that. But the thing is, what I've noticed about Ken Ham is like that. Ken Ham, you know, and like that, he will try to make you feel bad, like for doing it. And like I said during my d- 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 debate, Ken Ham can believe whatever he wants. What he believes is none of my business. But when I saw that series, Science versus the Ark Encounter, it definitely made me rethink. And I'm not saying, Cody, you have to. I'm just saying, I, I, know, I know. recommend that you check I that think, out. And I yeah. might want to chime on the theology. Yes, and I, I do agree that you do have to change your theology. But, you know, but personally, I don't see that as a bad you have thing. To change, you have to change the, the foundation for why Jesus died on the cross. You don't see any problem with that. Well, it's just that we have to understand Jesus died for us. Yeah, he died. He died on the cross and because of his death, that's paying our sins because yes. re- the death pays the sins because the death was brought in the world by sin. But if death exists before sin, then the death doesn't pay the sins. Therefore, Jesus' death on the cross doesn't pay our sins if evolution is true because then there was death before man sinned. That's the inconsistent theology. But like I said... It says death came to all men. It, um, and then on that day, Adam did not physically die. I know. He spiritually died. <clears throat> and yeah. so then that would explain it. Yep. He spiritually died. Um, and also, he died. And then also, death was brought into the world. Therefore, he actually died. Death. No, he died spiritually on the day. It says, in the day you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. So right, he ate. but Adam did not physically and, die. So then after that, then here comes his curse. God's saying all the things he's bringing in the world. He's totally changing everything, bringing in the curse of Genesis. Do you know why Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head? It's because the curse of Genesis, he's wearing it on his head. He, the, the curse of Genesis was out of the ground, thorns and thistles shall grow for you. That's why Jesus wore thorns and thistles on his head. It's so theologically significant. Even if even so, if evolution is true, it's Christian theology is messed up if evolution is true. I want to say, say it's messed up. It's just that you just mom is just that you just have to look at it differently. Um and like I said, just because one interpretation of uh, scripture says otherwise, it doesn't disprove Christianity. What does 
whether or not Jesus really was who he said that he was. So, so Cody, question for you. I, I, I relate. So do you think, the Bible's literally and stuff, do you think in, in Adam and Eve didn't sit, do that fruit thing, would, would everyone born from then to now still be alive now? Like the whole... Well, the, the Bible doesn't specifically say what would happen, but it seems to be from the interpretation of Scripture, just the general interpretation that they were made to live forever and then they sinned. So now death was brought in, so now they're not going to live forever. Yeah. So we'd be hanging out with Adam right now if, on, on Earth. If oh, I'm sure. I mean, he lived, he lived like 900 years. According to the Bible, he lived about 900 years, and most of the people before the flood did until the genetic bottleneck from Noah when it changed then but yeah so we if well i don't think we would be alive because god said to fill the earth he didn't say to overpopulate the earth and i never got to respond to eric on in a debate about that it's like yeah if they live forever the instruction was fill the earth he didn't say overpopulate it so if i was to be part of that population i would see adam yeah based on the what the bible says i hope that helps uh yeah but um um I think we've been going on with this a little uh, bit long, at, and I also am getting kind of hungry now. And you know, and yeah, um, me too. Yeah, and you know, and uh, trust me, if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for the time constraints, I definitely could go on. But it's just that you know, I don't want to starve myself. Okay, so, so as we wrap it up, you 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 guys want to like like what's the word uh, promote anything any of your future stuff on your on your channels and stuff? Who wants to go first? I'll go last. You can go, Eric. You can go, Eric. All right. Well, I've had my YouTube channel for 10 years now. Um, I started my channel when I was spiritual but not religious. And so then that's why in my old videos, I would cuss like a sailor and everything. And uh, um, my YouTube channel originally started up as a movie channel. It's because of the fact like, that I'm a big movie buff. And um, there's a lot of horror movie stuff on my channel. And I know that there's some disagreement about horror films and Christianity. But just me personally, I don't see a problem with it. Um, um, I, I don't know if Cody will agree or not. But that's a topic for a different day. But um, on my YouTube channel, I do still you know, do movie stuff. But I also didn't want to get redundant about it. And so then that's why I branched off. I have done a few philosophical stuff on it. And I have even, um, and I have even like, um, and, I, and I've even done like some comedy sketches, like, uh, like that. Hate. Uh, yeah. Um, I have this series called Things That Piss Me Off, and you know, I, and you know, I, the, the whole joke of the series is by the fact that, about like how you know, it, it, in the series, I. Uh, I actually play an exaggerated, angry version of me, and you know, and the whole joke of the series is, is like, oh my lord, like this guy is getting angry over like the silliest of things, and yeah. uh, and um, and there was a time in like when I would like do like a bunch of prank call videos, <laughs> and uh, I mean, the funny thing was like during one of them, I actually used a site like called Prank Dial. Mom, it pretty much is like where you can use like a uh, a fake number and like to prank call someone else and like where it's like a voice automated thing. Well, the funny thing is on one of them, I just by a huge coincidence, I actually ended up calling this guy by the same number as his girlfriend. <laughs> 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 oh man, that was funny. I was laughing so hard. And so um, recently, because of my debate with Ken Hoven, I'm beginning to a little bit more stuff about religion, but. Um, but because of the fact that not the majority of my audience are um, um, are Christians, it's because that when I started off my YouTube channel, I you know it wasn't about religion at all. So that's why in my videos about religion, um, I try to be careful with what I say. Um, it's because of course religion is a big topic, just like politics, abortion, and etc. And so, uh, mom, and so. Uh, so yeah, so my channel is definitely a variety of, of things. I mean, so um, uh, Dapper and I also even said that we should like do a movie talk podcast or something like that. Sometime. Yeah, I actually, um, I am a partner in a movie channel that's just recently started. 
Uh, nice. The CBAD show, CBADD. Uh, I am one of the four people there, but we are open to having the occasional guest. So, um, yeah, I would awesome. be interesting. Uh, yeah, I, awesome. I, I can volunteer for that. Okay. For the schedule. I mean, it's not entirely up to me. I am only one fourth of the team. Uh, the, the rest of the team, actually, uh, 75, 75% of the team is actually either on this stream or in the chat right now <laughs> because uh, Ben Tobin and Amos Marcos are also uh, 25%. And then Cheshire Vic, who you may recognize from some of Steve McRae's streams, is also uh, rounds out our four person. Connect team. Network connections. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so that's one thing I have to, to plug is check that out. Uh, we are mostly doing riff track style things. So a lot of our, for movies that we can't play on screen, which is most movies, we have an on-screen time code so that you can check the time code of the movie you're watching to sync it up. And uh, we also have Manos, The Hands of Fate, and Night of the Living Dead, which we do show on screen and do have the full audio for the movies. So I mean, when you say not after living dead, I mean there are so so many versions of it. The There's original the version, yeah, yeah. The the original one, um, the, it's in black and white and all. Uh, the only other thing yeah. I have really to plug is my name. 2006. That one was. That yes, one was. No. Yeah. We'll pass on that. I mean, we might do it to make fun of it, but uh, my other thing that I have is my main channel. Um, I do mostly um, science related content and usually I use the misunderstanding of someone of some science involved as a launching point to talk about whatever the topic is. So if someone says something silly about astronomy and I'll put that in as a clip and I'll go talk about astronomy or someone says something silly about evolution and I'll do Samurai that. Kapo, yeah, Bob. Right. Samurai Cop, I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, Space Cop and Samurai Cop. Yeah, that, those, are, those are things we're gonna have to get to. Um, as far as coming up, I am in the process of animating and rendering part three of a video series about uh, some Genesis apologetics material. Uh, I also am at the beginning of uh, a video talking about the law of monophyly in, as it relates to both the past and the future. And I'm going to be using a uh, website that I quite enjoyed uh, to do it. And I just got permission from the website's creator. so. That's actually going to work out. Um, and I was informed recently that one of my viewers specifically alerted Kent Hoven to my channel. So <laughs> there may actually be some response videos from Kent Hoven to me, which I may end up responding to. So that, that could be live stream fodder. Because as you might know, I do a series called Kent with Bent, with Bent Hoven mm -hmm. here, where we, um, we go live and I live respond to Kent Hovind videos while getting uh, exaggeratedly upset. It's, it's sort of a character. I'm not you know, honestly that angry, right. but it's, it's for comedic effect mostly. Mom, it kind of goes back to what I said about my uh, Things That Piss Me Off series. You know, don't take it seriously. It's just a joke. And, uh, and uh, I actually forgot to mention this. On uh, the 27th of this month, I'm actually going to be doing a podcast with, uh, I'm going to be doing a podcast with uh, Inspiring Philosophy. One of the reasons why that I thought I should do the podcast with him is because of the fact that it'll be really interesting how, that we would do a podcast about both of our debates with uh, Ken Holbind. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so, so on the 27th, I believe 6 or 7 p.m. my time, which is a mountain time, you can look forward to that. I mean, it's okay. not the first time he has been on my channel. All right, so Cody, anything you want to advertise for your coming up for you? Um, I don't have a lot online, but my YouTube channel is Cody Sorensen. Um, if you just type Cody, then S and O, you'll see it. Um, yeah, can you, mind, yeah mind, can, you put, can you put all your links in the in the chat so I can put it in the description? So I, 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 I literally just have the YouTube. So like, okay. I mean. I'll, I'll, I guess, I'm actually. I just found uh, Cody's. Um, the the problem you're gonna see a lot of my old music, um, when it was released with labels and stuff. When you type my name, but the channel should be at the top. Um, actually, right, I just went to Cody's channel. Yeah, you can link I'll it or whatever. I'll listen to your intro. I. Uh, it's a nice. That's a nice narration. Yeah, like can somebody put the links, all the links in the channels. So I can put in the description later on. Yeah, I'll just. Okay. Um, cool. Anyway. But yeah, I kind of um, would like to 
I kind of I like to finally have my meal now. So I got, yeah, I got to wrap it up. I'll wrap it up real fast. Yeah, I'm, I'm just right. adding links. Okay. I'm starving. Like, okay, me, me too. But anyways, join me. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. Join me this Saturday with my guest from last Saturday as we t uh, for, as we talk about the conclusion of the Dr. Nopa series with Dr. Nopa V3. As I always say, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next time. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Now I can finally go eat.